angel, black angel, as you grow up, I want you to drink from the plenty cup. My little black angel, my little black angel, my little black angel, as years roll by, I want you to fly with wings held high. I want you to live by the justice code. I want you to burn down freedom's road. My little black angel, my little black angel, my little black angel, my little black angel. Fly away, fly away, sleeping. Fly away, safe in my arms. Father, your future protects you, locks you safe from all harm. Little black angel, I feel so glad. You'll never have things I never had. And out of men's hearts, all hate is gone. It's better to die than forever live on. My little black angel. A little bit of height. Maybe we'll get some viewers. you to burn down freedom's road. They took down that horrible Ukrainian flag from their front page. Beef Chief, I'm not a pagan. Better not fuck it up. Oh, I will. I will. My little, my little black angels are all in here. Two streams in one month. We are blessed. Well, hopefully that, that changes. But, um, done a bunch of, a bunch of reading, reading and stuff. Lots of reading. And I'll just say, uh, part of the theme that I've been talking about for a while is I become increasingly disillusioned with sort of ticky-tack challenges to narrative. And there are a few reasons for this. By presenting individual sort of case challenges, like challenging the colonialism narrative, challenging just the Holocaust, challenging denial of divergent evolution in humans. You know, the observer has sort of a kind of escape 
Why you stream so late? It's three o'clock where I am. <laughs> um, the problem is that like all of the other elements of, of like the narrative, they keep kicking in someone's mind. So they don't have to stop being a shit lib. Um, they're not going to have sort of that basis of resistance of the coming struggle of the white minority in the United States. And that's what we need to be thinking about. Um, and the thing is, it was a, the belief in all of these narratives in Toto that led to, you know, the problem that we're in and, and sort of ticky tack opposition to each individual narratives or like, you know, don't, don't, um, challenge too many things all at, all at once. Don't, you know, you, you can only be uh, a heretic on so many things. So a non-comprehensive attack on like whole system narrative, it, it has that psychological problem. Because in reality, this narrative, it's one. It's a singular thing. It's one religion. Colonialism, race denial, the oppression arc, the Nazis and the Holocaust, it's all part of the same story. Okay, they're not separate. They were formed by the same kinds of people with the same sort of tools of hysteria and censorship. Um, and this is something that I always kind of knew or at least had suspicions for a while, for a long time. Before I get into the meat, I'll just talk about sort of my personal, you know, primitives before getting to uh, sort of a full-on revision. This is not going to be about the, uh, the Holocaust, but this is going to be about um, the idea of Hitler's foreign military aggression. And personally, my suspicion of this, that Hitler didn't start the war, um, this goes way back. I, you know, the, the first sort of seeds of doubt was when I would just analyze World War II from a purely war-making ability basis, sort of when trying to come up with my own mods for Hearts of Iron 2, not Hearts of Iron 4, Hearts of Iron 2 way back in the day. Just uh, going through documents, trying to come up with some um, heuristic for the material resources of the US, UK, the Soviet Union, Japan, Germany, Italy. And when doing this, this wasn't alone enough to convince me, right? After all, leaders do an inexplicably stupid thing. Like for example, the political leadership of Yugoslavia and Poland in 1941 and 1938, respectively. Their foreign policy decisions were inexplicably stupid. Um, so the fact that a course of action that's being attributed to Hitler is so obviously stupid, right, which is a conclusion you come to when you start <laughs> wargaming the resources, um, that's not enough itself to prove that he didn't take this course of action. Um And another thing that perhaps helped me personally is that I don't know what it is, but I've always sort of been able to distinguish tactical from strategic aggression, right? For example, Putin's invasion of Ukraine doesn't necessarily make Putin the aggressor in a strategic sense, nor did Germany's advance through Belgium in 1914, or the fact that Germany declared war on France in 1914 made Imperial Germany a strategic aggressor. And that's something that I think is an easier case to make for a lot of people, because there's not a big anti-Kaiser Wilhelm hit religion narrative sort of thing. This is the anti-Hitler, but Kaiser Wilhelm is seen as just kind of a kind of a dunce who bumbled into war. Because the thing is, I think I and not, not just me, but like lots of people, they understand the West's game in conflict, right? They have control of the seas, raw materials, right? They have the, the, the British Empire and the United States is functionally sort of the same thing with their indirect control over most of the planet and, and Latin America, the Middle East, right? Um, and their goal for any conflict is to always just wait it out or if if it comes into a shooting war to grind it out right they always have the luxury to sit back they typically don't have to engage in as much tactical level of aggression because they could always just blockade by land in the case of the ussr or by sea in the case of the us and the uk 
What this meant is that I personally was never bowled over by the fact, oh, Hitler invaded Denmark and Norway, right, or Holland and Belgium, okay? These, these were never convincing to me that Hitler was a great aggressor, you know, and certainly the attacks on France and Britain cannot be seen as aggression at all because they, they started the war. So now these inv invasions... You know, it's not that they would ever got my seal of approval or that I would ask anyone to approve of such things. That's not what I'm saying here. But it was Britain and France that forced Germany into a situation where they had to invade these countries if they were to have any hope of winning the war that France and Britain had declared on Germany. Over Poland? Okay. But the point remains, France and Britain declared war on Germany, forcing Germany to do what they had to do in the West, if they had any, if they were to have any hope of winning, because the Maginot Line worked. So, and look, it may come to playing so many of these, like, like war games or whatever, which you can poo-poo, you know. But the thing is, I don't think there's any more comprehensive simulators of at least the material side of World War II, not necessarily the political side. I think they get that wrong. But on the material side of World War II, then certain realism mods for Hearts of Iron 4. And seriously, you know, it's just a game, bro. Okay, but, like, these guys, like, are like turbo autists that go through all kinds of archives to get the resources and the factory counts and the pop counts all correct. Okay? If Hearts of Iron 4 was some proprietary strategic war simulator for the U.S. Army... People would take it a lot more seriously just because it didn't have the label game on it. Now, some things in it are BS, like applied passive buffs for research and stuff. But your enemies get those too. So from a balance of power standpoint, simulation, it, that even a lot of the unrealistic things shouldn't matter much because everyone gets a lot of stupid things that you, you wouldn't get in real life. Like just because you research decimetric radar doesn't mean, oh, all your radar is upgraded, you know. Obviously, that doesn't happen in the real world, but that shouldn't upset the apple cart too much because everyone gets those passive instant buffs. Um, so, you know, and I played through this, you know, usually a 1936 start, so, though some of the cooler mods have a 1933 start. Rhineland, Austria, Sudeti, Czechia, Poland. Rhineland, Austria, Sudeti, Czechia, Poland. It makes some sense. Most of these mods, the modders include a path to be friendly towards Poland. And sometimes the focus to have the Poles be willing to give up Danzig for an alliance against Bolshevism or whatever. You know, you can do that. But if you choose the Nazi path, you almost never can do that. Right? The assumption being that Hitler wouldn't countenance such a thing. Why can't I choose to ally with Poland? When playing the game, you know, the Czech state here, you know, it's it's obnoxious, this, this this Czechoslovakia thing. What is the purpose of this Czechoslovakia thing having a military? What could their military possibly be for? What could the Czech military possibly be for, if you look at sort of the map? Let me do show... What could a military for this state possibly be for? Who could it possibly be aimed against? And when, Slav and when Slovakia is cleaved off, what is, what is the purpose of such a military, of such a state? And the only thing I can see, you know, if I'm playing as, as sort of, not necessarily as, as Hitler himself, Typically in these games, you play as sort of the spirit of the nation and you sort of work through your political leaders and stuff. But um, what could that military possibly be for? You know, cut off this. I don't know if you see my cursor, but cut off this half because Slovakia breaks off later, as we know. What could the military of this state possibly be for? Who could it possibly be aimed against? The only thing I can see is that th their military could stab us in the back at some later date if we were to come into conflict with these other states. Yeah, I bet the Brits don't like the idea of getting rid of this ticking time bomb. That's literally, you know, because once they take Austria, once 
right? It's literally inside our country. So even before knowing of Hotch's trip to Berlin, and when I believed the orthodoxy that the quasi-annexation of Chechia was something planned from the start by Hitler, which as I'll hopefully show it was not, but even when I thought that, okay, it's conquest, but what, do, do we just keep 150,000 guys here for all eternity? You know, for most conquests, if you think about most conquests, if you think about, you know, let's see if we can find a world map somewhere, you know, when Russia's going into Central Asia here, or, you know, the, the status of Mongolia, for a while has always been sort of questionable. Is it really an independent state? Is it part of the Soviet Union? You know, same with uh, Xinjiang for a period. Was it, did the Soviet Union occupy it or was it independent? This is sort of these gray, like Soviet troops are going through Xinjiang, going through Mongolia, you know. But the thing is, for most conquests, the state has to go out of its way to conquer something. They must exert themselves to conquer. For Chechia, For Chechia here in like 1938-39, it is more of an exertion to not conquer it. It is a greater strain on manpower, war material, and supply to not conquer Chechia than it would be to conquer it. Like, what is this? And so when I'm sort of playing the game, it's like, what is this little asshole country doing right in the middle of my country? Um, and look, I'm not saying you have to be happy about this or support this. Okay, and again, I'm operating under the false, what I will later show as false assumption that this was some organized, you know, conquest campaign by Hitler. But even if it was, I'm not saying you should be happy about it or support it or think that it's a good thing, that it's good that Hitler was in, quote unquote, the right, whatever that means, to, to conquer Chechia. Not Slovakia, but Chechia. Okay. But a Nazi invasion of this state is not some great proof of some grand conquest campaign by Hitler, even if the orthodox narr narrative on Chechia is true, which it's not. And while I can't axiomatically prove this, you know, you just know that any country which has some other country basically inside of it of a substantial size, right? Not talking about micro states like wherever San Marino is or the Vatican, like, but if say some country, you know, if say there was a country sort of inside the United States, like Texas or were an independent country, the U S would invade, or let's say the whole of the Southeastern United States was a separate country that pressing up right against their their capital and core industrial base right along here like the entire southeastern US if that was a separate country you know the US would invade or let's say there was some country out in like the middle of sort of Utah i don't know maybe it was started by some um some christian heresy based on based on some guy who saw some magic plates somewhere and they believed in magic underwear and this state was, you know, they called it some stupid name, like Deseret, because they were in the middle of a desert or something, right? Um, yeah, the U.S. would probably invade that state. They would not allow some foreign country to continue to exist in the middle of their own country, right? Or say you had some country that called themselves the Sioux Nation or some, some other stupid name. The U.S. would probably invade it. Let's say if France, you know, controlled New Orleans and also controlled like a whole bunch of other stuff up here, but that was sort of unsettled at the time. At the time, sort of, the, let's say, the settled own ownership, owned area that France, like, really sort of directly controlled was, like, New Orleans, Louisiana, sort of this country right in the middle of the United States. I think the U.S. would, would invade, or at least threaten to invade, right? It's kind of obnoxious. And the point isn't to have some justification for any of these things. Right, whatever justification could possibly mean in terms of state conflict, is simply to say that the expectations, the expectations which France and Britain were putting on the Hitler regime, 
were far more obnoxious than anything any other major power has ever been expected to follow in sort of their home areas. Now, if you're an Orthodox bro on this, maybe you accept what I'm saying here on Chechia, right? It, it was a... It was a materially and logistically obnoxious state. And in fact, I suspect it was sort of, that was by design, by Treaty of Versailles, this state would be uh, materially and logistically obnoxious, right? Sort of carved right out of the former Habsburg domain. And that, yes, it was hypocritical of the West to expect Hitler to not invade Chechia. And, but you may retort, you may retort, okay, that is an obnoxious sort of, uh, to, to hold up Chechia as a cup of trembling, but Hitler still should have been opposed in Chechia because he's literally Hitler. Have you heard about the Holocaust, right? So if an Orthodox bro is watching, okay, but maybe can you look into singular things? without flailing and lunging about in these sort of emotional spasms to, to then call in the rest of the entire narrative all at once, right? Because the way narratives get deconstructed is one piece at a time, okay? And if whenever someone tries to deconstruct one piece, you start lunging about and calling in the whole of the narrative, well, then, then congratulations, you'll never be proven wrong, right? Um, you're, you're, un, you're unfalsifiable. Um, so I'm going to take some time with this. So as we've already gone over with authorities and minutiae grinding, sort of giving the example of a, of a college football game, um, talking about the universality of religion, um, and previously in the uh that's like leaving the cathedral document not a name I, I i like but i can't really think of that good of a name for it um the process the whole process of the university the thing is to this day there is a terrible lesson that was learned right a terrible lesson learned from the second war against germany that lesson is never appeased um, so I just decided, let's just go through a list of successful appeasements from 1800 to today. What would be called, what would be called appeasement? We're going to look at appeasements, appeasements of Russia, when states appeased Russia. Okay, one would be the Treaty of Aigun, right, when China handed over this area, outer Manchuria, to Russia. Right, Russia didn't used to have this, Russia used to go sort of like this see the cursor um they didn't they didn't go all the way this huge area that goes down to vladivostok that was handed over to russia upon threat of of invasion during the opium wars and that was not the thin end of some ultimate conquest of china it, it simply was not um finland handing over chunks of territory to the soviet union right that that's a <laughs> um, this appeasement of Finland by Finland of the Soviet Union, this appeasement was so successful that even after Finland reinvaded the Soviet Union in 1941, right, started the war up again in 1941, after being defeated in that war a second time, the Soviet Union still did not go on to annex the rest of Finland. Right, which by like sort of geopolitical law, like by by all rights, they would be in, in their right. Not that I'm a fan of it, because I'm not a fan of the Soviet Union. But in sort of the the geopolitical chessboard sort of things, that would not be atrocious for the Soviet Union to to annex Finland upon their failed reinvasion. Um, this area was handed. It's kind of a small area. Uh, that sort of goes down into it's today part of Azerbaijan, but it was handed over to the Russian Empire by Persia. Um, that did not portend some later ultimate conquest of Persia. Um, we can also look at Russian appeasement of other states. Uh, Russia, quote unquote, selling Alaska to the United States. Obviously, similar to France, quote unquote, selling the Louisiana Purchase. It was not a real sale. 
It was not. It was not sold at its it, anything like its true cost, even perceived at the time. Um, these these were appeasements of the United States. This did not portend some some later uh, United States. Uh, this was not the thin end of some wedge of, of some uh, U.S. greater conquest of whatever. Right? It did not portend the U.S. conquest of Canada it did, or any further advancements into Russia. Um, the appeasement of Japan following the Russo-Japanese War, where Japan basically took over Manchuria, basically. Uh, this was so successful, this was so successful, in fact, that Japan did not seize territory from the Soviet Union during the Russian Civil War in the Far East. There were proposals to do so. There was there was scuttlebutt in, in, in Tokyo. Say, hey, Russia's down. This is, you know, really not entirely free, but cheaper than it will ever be. We can take all of this land. You know, there were proposals to go to have Lake Baikal sort of be like the border that Japan would take all of this. And, <laughs> but Japan still respected the outer Manchurian lands and all of Sakhalin. They respected all of this. Um, and they respected all of this and they respected the Manchurian border based on for the Soviet Union based on a treaty that they signed, not even with the Soviet Union. They signed it with Tsarist Russia, right? They didn't sign it with, with, uh, with Lenin. They signed it with whoever the, they signed it with Alexander. That is how incredibly successful the Russian appeasement of Japan following the Russo-Japanese War was, okay? Super successful appeasement. Um, the same could be said of the United States, quote unquote, selling Alaska, that the United States never made any forays to take over the Russian Far East when they very easily could, because there was a there was a, a U.S. and Japanese expedition into the Russian Far East. They basically had functional control over the area, but then they just handed it back over to the Soviet Union, not even to Tsarist Russia. They handed it over to a government, which was which they by their own decision, recognized as a successor state to Tsarist Russia and, and, you know, an inheritor of the treaties of Tsarist Russia, even though they by no means had to. Um, we can also look at the appeasement uh, regarding the Habsburgs. Um, this map is gets a little... But the Habsburgs, so you, you guys know, oh, here, here's the Habsburgs. Um, in the Habsburg Italian Wars, they gave up ground three times to various Italian states and eventually to the Kingdom of Italy itself. This was not the beginning of some eventual Italian conquest of the Habsburg realm. Um, now, whether this appeasement of Italy was successful, some would argue against that. Certainly, Italy's entry into World War I seems to, to, seems to suggest that this was not a successful appeasement campaign. However, I think I think the Habsburgs failed by not appeasing enough, um, and this was and this is not just uh, this is an idea not without entirely not without basis because when Hitler finished the appeasement of Italy, Mussolini became an ally. Right after World War One, Italy took this area, South Tyrol, this area sort of here. And Italy became not an enemy of the Germans, right? When I say the Germans, I mean the German Empire and Austria-Hungary sort of operating as kind of a, a commissariat of the German Empire. And during World War I, Kaiser Wilhelm kept trying to get the Habsburgs to give up this land, right? To keep Italy at least out of the war, perhaps even enter on their side. But at the very least, keep them out of the war. So even what on the surface looks like a failed appeasement of the Habsburgs of Italy 
ended up being successful when the appeasement was finished. And certainly the whole, like, of the United States, the whole story of the United States is various powers appeasing the United States, okay? Um, either by war or by threat of war, right? The Louisiana Purchase, Alaska, these quote-unquote purchases that weren't really purchases. Um, and, you know, and same with, you know, the Spanish-American War, United States declared war on Spain, you know, did, did a, did a false flag and, you know, had a war, war against Spain, took some of Spanish territories. This was not the thin end of the wedge of some later conquest of Spain. And it was not the springboard. It, it wasn't even the springboard of further conquests elsewhere. You know, once they took the Philippines, the United States didn't become like, all right, now we're going to go into Thailand. Right. Certainly they weren't going to go into French into China because the French were there and they had a the French were militarily competent, but it wasn't a springboard of the U.S. to then try to gobble up the last remaining um, independent, quasi-independent state of Thailand. Right? It was not the. It was not a springboard for further conquest once the U.S. took the Philippines from Spain, in what was basically an unprovoked war of aggression. So, and the, and another thing regarding Mexico, the U.S. and Mexico. This is a really strong case for appeasement because the United States not only they fought one war against Mexico to take Texas and then fought another war to take the rest of the southwestern U.S., what became the Southwest. And so this was two appeasements. So Mexico appeased once. They didn't finish. Right. But the appeasement wasn't, quote unquote, finished. And the United States invaded again and took over the rest of, of the Southwest. And then they stopped. Right, those two conquests were not the thin end of the wedge of the eventual eventual conquest of of sort of Mexico proper. Right, the the core of the Mexican state of the Mexican people, I guess, which is sort of down here. Right, it's not really up here. This is sparsely populated area, but down here, which is where basically core Mexico, you know, the Mexico Valley. As it's called. So now I have a request here. Don't infer things that I'm not saying. I'm not saying Mexico should be happy to give up all that land. And no, n not at all. Don't infer stupid things. The point here is merely that a territorial concession is not usually the thin end of the wedge to some total conquest. You know, take the Russian acquisitions of, um, of Crimea, Donetsk, and Luhansk like today, do these territories make Russia? Is taking Crimea and then Donetsk and Luhansk sort of here. Do these territories make Russia so much stronger that the balance of power is substantially disrupted? Okay, not at all. Or that the self-determination of Ukrainians is menaced any more than it was before Russia took these territories. The independence of Ukraine has always been a function of NATO backing. That was true before the Russian invasion, and it's true now. Okay, Ukrainian independence has never been contingent upon the defensive capabilities of Ukraine itself, particularly in the ethnically Russian part of the Ukrainian state. In terms of the global balance of power, you know, that shift away from the West towards sort of a Eurasian block or sort of the world island block that's going on between Russia, China, and India. Um, that block was allowed to develop independently from sort of what's going on. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Ukraine itself, right? That sh the shift in the balance of power has nothing to do with territorial things in Ukraine. If anything, this is just a symptom. This is just a ship symptom of the shift in power, not not a cause and certainly not doesn't have any real relevant effect on the defensive abilities of the ukrainian state so <laughs> and this thing that's happening this formation of sort of a world island block which i'm kind of agnostic about whether it's good or bad 
right? Russia, China, India, you know, Persia starting to work with the Russians, right? And so you have this, Russia, China, India, Persia. These states in the middle, what are they going to have to do surrounded by, by these powers, right? As India starts to become a little bit more independent and all that. Um, the, the funny thing about this, when you look at World War II, what state was trying to contain the Russian portion of this Eurasian bloc, this world island? And this is something that British foreign policy people were, was sort of their, their nightmare for a long time, right? Which is why, which is why they fought the Crimean War, uh, one of, one of the, the real atrocities of the British Empire was the, was the Crimean War. Other atrocities of the British Empire that are real, not the bullshit lies about India, uh, but what I would call the atrocities of the British Empire are the Crimean War, the Opium Wars, which is just, you know, kind of disgusting, you know, s sending in a bunch of drugs to the Chinese to get them to, to sell, to get them to buy, to trade with the British when they didn't want to, so we're going to drug them up. That that was kind of, that, that's kind of horrible. Um, and the Boer Wars. So those were the main, those were the real atrocities of the British Empire. And of course, later, the anti-German wars, those were also pretty horrible things. Um, so those are the real atrocities of the, of the British Empire. The Crimean War, the Opium Wars, the Boer War, and the Two World Wars. Those were, the, those were the, the real bad things of the British Empire, not the crap about, oh, they conquered India, boo-hoo. Um, but... When you look at who was fighting <laughs> the, the, the incipient elements of this world island bloc, well, Germany was committed to containing Russia. Japan was committed to containing China. Britain already had control of India and what would today be Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan. They also basically controlled Tibet, Burma. So the world island block was contained. Britain was containing their their part of it. China was or Japan was committed to containing their part of it. Germany was committed to containing their part of it. If you have some moral opposition to what the what the Germany and Japan were doing, well, that's okay. You know, you can have some moral oppositions or whatever, but don't then cry about, you know, <laughs> don't then cry about this Eurasian block later forming. And forming, you know, successfully when you waged the most terrible wars in history to destroy the very powers that were containing this Eurasian bloc. Okay, um, let me um, let me look at the chat here. What's chat saying? Chat saying some stuff. Uh, ba, ba, ba. we force the Chinese to be addicted to drugs, but black people are poor. Boo hoo, Africa. <laughs> exactly. Like th that's what's so funny about this is that the actual states that that because there were states that did get fucked over by sort of the Western British alliance. Also, I need to the notifications from from the white power chats are not coming. I will read all of the white power chats. Don't don't worry. So if you send a chat with a message. I will read it, okay? Um, but I don't want to get derailed on stuff. But yeah, so th there were actual horrible, horrible things done by the British Empire, but that's not what's up. That's not what's brought up today. What's brought up today are lies about India or the or the the Bengal famine lie. You know, all, all the when, when it, it, there are actually bad things that the British Empire did. The Opium Wars things so, just. I don't know if the opium wars were the most damaging things, getting a whole bunch of Chinese addicted to opium in order to basically ex exploit them in terms of the actual harm, like in term like World War One was certainly more harmful, but the opium wars just feel gross to me. They, they, it just feels like really disgusting. Like what the fuck are you doing? Like, like, really? Like, what the fuck? Like, it, it's it's hard for me to believe that that Britons could support the opium wars. I mean, in comparison, in comparison, looking at say, 
Um, let's do this here. In comparison, like when the Russians, like after the Boxer Rebellion, the Russians said, yeah, we're just going to invade Manchuria. We're just going to take this. Later, you know, we're just going to take Mongolia, sort of. The, the, the political independent status of Mongolia has always been kind of like, who knows? You know, are they really an independent state? Are they part of the Soviet Union? Are they part of China? Is, Mongolia has always been kind of a gray, like, who knows? Same, same to a lesser extent with Xinjiang. Um, and so in that sense, like what the Russians did with China seems almost... I wouldn't say honorable because they were kicking them while they were down and while they were being beset by a bunch of other foreign powers during the Boxer Rebellion. But it almost seems like less nasty. Like, I, I don't know, there's a certain straightforwardness to like, you have territory. We want that territory. We're going to send armies out to fight your armies for that territory. Our armies beat your armies. Sign over the territory. I mean, war is hell. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not pro-war. But, like, there's a certain... I don't know. I would certainly say that's more respectable than what the British did. And certainly what all these foreign powers did by, by creating, like, trade monopolies over certain segments of China. I mean, what they did to China was just disgusting. Was just gross i would feel a lot better about the european powers regarding china if they just send in big big armies and just conquered china right if they just did that if they just send a big army and say yeah we're taking over china right we're we're straightforward bald-faced imperial conquest we're just taking over period you know if they just did that it wouldn't that's that's to me that's less disgusting than what they actually did anyway so we're dealing with like NATO and for me, NATO starts with the British empire. It goes way before NATO. The existence of NATO exists long before the formal organization of NATO. In 1853, 1853, Russia, obviously you're going to have to use your imagination because the borders were very different back then. Russia controlled all of this, all of Ukraine, big chunk of, of Poland, sort of like this. Russia was going into the Balkans, 1853. They basically held Romania at this time. That was another thing, part of the Crimean War, is that basically the Russians were kicked out of Romania. But they basically controlled Romania. Not legally, it was one of those like protectorate sort of stupid things, but basically they controlled Romania. And they were going from Romania into Bulgaria, into Serbia, and saying, hey, guess what? You guys don't need to be part of the Ottoman Empire anymore. You can be independent, but please let Russian troops go through, you know, Russian influence in the Balkans, whatever that may end up meaning. So France, France, Britain, some Italian, I think, Kingdom of Naples, but mainly France and, France and Britain sent troops to bolster the Ottomans. So that the Russians couldn't take all this. And it was a horrific war, the Crimean War. Something like 400,000 Russians ended up getting killed. About a quarter of a million of the coalition against Russia ended up getting killed. It was a costly, terrible war. The war took place in the Balkans. They did a landing in Crimea, which gave the war its name. And there were some excursions into the Baltic. So this was a horrible, costly war. It redirected, of course, what it ended up doing is it ended up sort of redirecting Russia's expansionist direction towards Central Asia, and they ended up, of course, taking over all of this following the Crimean War, right? And I think it's sort of the military planners of Russia realized they couldn't, it, it, maybe they could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with the West with a few reforms. I mean, they, they lost 400,000 to 250,000, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like Russia had like a, like a third world army, but they obviously weren't up to par with Western armies. They're obviously, you know, a few steps behind on a man for man basis. So they drove east. They 
drove, drove into these guys. Then, in 1877, Russia just invaded again. Right? They just invaded the Balkans. Now, I'm kind of fuzzy on the political status of these Balkan states because Russia goes in and the Russia, this is the Russo-Turkish War, starts in 1877. Russia goes in, they win, they basically draw, I guess they drive the Ottomans out of the Balkans. But the thing is, then there's, an, then there's a, another war of independence in 1911 called the Balkan Wars, and there was one in 1912. So are these wars for independence from the Ottomans? But wasn't that achieved in 1877 when the Russians just came in and said, you're free? I, I, don't, really, I don't really understand the political independence situation of the Bal Balkan states. I don't, I don't get it. It's sort of an enigma to me, but apparently, but the point is, 1853, Britain, France go in and they're, and they're holding up Ottoman control of, over the Balkans, okay? 24 years later, Russia does the same thing. There's no intervention from the West and the great nightmares, the great fear that Russian expansion is going to, that they're going to take the straits. And, they're, and then this, this fear that the British had of Russia was bizarre. It was frankly bizarre because what, what happens if the Russians take the straits? Well, now their Black Sea fleet can menace the Mediterranean. They can, they can go out of here through the straits. And then what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Like if they control Anatolia, I mean that's not free. That that's not like free territory. That's going to be expensive to occupy in perpetuity. Turks are not fans of the Russians. That's not like oh now it's just expansion of Russian territory. No, it's it's land that they have to expend resources to occupy. And then what? Then the great Russian naval might can. It was bizarre, and it's still bizarre. It's still a, a, a bizarre fear. But the point is, the second time around, the British just asked the Russians. They just talked. They said, hey, stay away from the Straits. For, frankly, I think the British fear of Russian fleets going through the Dardanelles, I think that's, that's, that was an irrational fear on the part of the British. But even so, the British just asked the Russians, don't go to the Straits. The Russians complied. And what ended up happening? It ended up being a quick war where the Balkan peoples, I guess, got some greater degree of autonomy from the Ottoman. Obviously, they didn't get full autonomy because then by 1911, they're fighting more wars against the Ottomans. Whatever. But the point is, when the British decided to just talk and to not engage in some fucking death war, the war was short and sharp. And it was not, and it didn't, and it didn't lead to some later steamrolling of Russian conquest over the whole of Europe, right? What the hell was the Crimean War even for? Okay, the Crimean War is really the first major falsification of this NATO doctrine of, of forever war, of this of Britain's no talk, just war policy that they would repeat against Germany twice you know, uh, maniacally lunging into two wars that destroyed the British Empire and handed over half of Europe to the Soviet Union. Okay, the insanity of NATO is that they don't even talk, except when they want to, right? To avoid a war, right? For example, um, for example, during what was called the Great Game, I mean, I, the Great Game as it was called, but the game was Russia conquers this. I don't know why they call it the great game. The game is Russian armies, because this is a logistically difficult area to go through, especially at the time, so it took a while. But Russia, the, the great game was Russia takes over all this. That's the great game. Anyway, uh, but when the British said, hey, um, Tsar, let's keep Afghanistan independent, right? And Afghanistan will serve as a buffer between you and India. And let's keep Iran, you know, somewhat in a, sort of independent. And that'll serve as a buffer between Russia and the Persian Gulf and British 
whatever the British are doing down in the Persian Gulf. They, they have little betrucial states here and stuff. And that prevented any great war between Russia and the British Empire in sort of the Iran, Afghanistan, Xinjiang area. When the British just talked, guess what? No war. And, and there was no mad czar hell-bent on world conquest, right? It didn't happen because the British didn't want it. When they just talked, either the war does, doesn't happen at all, or in the case of the Russo-Turkish War, the, the war is short and sharp and leads to a quick victory for, you know, the, the Christian power. So, um... Now, I don't mention in this uh, the Napoleonic Wars. I don't mention British policy during the Napoleonic Wars because that was a situation where I think Napoleon was actually being unreasonable, where Napoleon was given several reasonable offers and he shot them down. Um, so Napoleon was actually the unreasonable one in, in that period. And Britain was actually the one trying to come up with some reasonable peace where France got some territory, but... France wasn't allowed to have everything that they that they wanted, and th and this was true right right up until like the very end, right? I believe it was sort of eighteen ten, when when um the coalition against Napoleon was allowing Napoleon to have most of what it had, basically a border all the way up to the Rhine, you know, um, <laughs> more than France has today, and Napoleon said, "No, I'm gonna I want to keep control over." So Napoleon was the intransigent one that situation now to my knowledge let's go to the the new the new map not well older map i guess to my knowledge the germans made at the very least two peace overtures to the west during what became world war one um the first that I know of was on February 6th, 1915, and the second was on December of 1916. Um, now, we know at that date, in February of 1915, German ambassadors were actually approaching the U.S. ambassadors, not the French and British ambassadors. They were approaching the United States ambassador in Germany with an offer to begin peace talks with the West. Now, that is interesting. Right. And I, I really, really, really wish that the Germans at this time on Imperial Germany, that they had made a much bigger stink about their peace overtures than they actually did. Um, a little bit of hindsight knowledge, but whatever. I, I wish the Germans made a much bigger stink about this because if they because if because we know we know that the Germans approached the U.S. ambassador in February of 1915. Right, which is six months after the war began. And in all likelihood, if, if, if they're approaching the U.S. ambassador in February of 1915, it's like 99.9 .9 repeating percent chance that they try to approach the French and British embassies, try to make some contact with the actual countries that they were at war at, war, with war with, right? Because they're because the thing is they're not going to approach the U.S. ambassador before trying to directly negotiate with the British and French. The fact that they're negotiating or trying to talk to the Americans in February of 1915 basically guarantees that they had tried with the French and British before then. So there's this guy, uh, James W. Gerard. Uh, um, the ambassador to Germany. Oh, yeah, this is from his autobiography, My First 83 Years in America. <laughs> um, and this is a quote from what, what he wrote from his autobiography, My First 83 Years in America. He says, In addition to the cable which I had already received informing me that Colonel House was fully commissioned to act, he himself reminded me of, of my duty in his February 16th postscript, uh, 1915. In his own handwriting, these were the words from House. And this is Gerard quoting House. Quote within a quote, The president has just repeated to me your cablegram to him and says he has asked you to communicate directly with me, Colonel House, in the future. 
All authority, therefore, had been invested in Colonel House Direct. The president, Woodrow Wilson, ceased to be even a conduit of communications. Right, Woodrow Wilson ceased to be a conduit of communications to the Kaiser of Germany at this time. He, who had never been appointed to any position, who had never been passed by the Senate, Colonel House, was fully instructed and commissioned to act in the most grave situation. I have never ceased to wonder how he managed to attain such power and influence. So Wilson wasn't even talking to the Germans. He, he, was, he said, talk to this guy, Colonel House. Right? And we know what that is. That he's giving them the runaround. And this is in February of 1915. Wilson is not interested in trying to mediate any kind of peace talks. I don't know for sure. And I wish, and again, I wish the Germans had documented and shouted from the mountainside their peace proposals to Britain and France. Um, this is something that the Nazis also failed at somewhat. The Nazis did a better job, but they were still inexplicably not screaming about their offers to peace, not making a bigger stink than they did of that, that we're offering peace. Kind of leaving us in, in sort of bizarre situation where Hitler's peace proposals, Hitler's peace proposals are something that you have to go somewhat digging to find. Hitler's peace proposals are something that should be in every introductory textbook right what were the terms hitler was offering to end the war that's something that everyone should fucking know same thing is happening with this um this war in ukraine how many people even know putin's peace terms how many people even know it's insane like because Putin's peace terms are basically the definition of what the war is being fought over, and people literally don't know what that is. What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, that is media control. And but the thing is, the media control it only works if people are idiots. So 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 the cattle is to blame as well. Um. So I look, you know, I look on Quora. And I find people mentioning like peace terms from Imperial Germany. Right. And they claim that, oh, the initial proposals by the Germans, supposedly, who knows? I, 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 don't, I haven't seen these proposals from the Germans. Supposedly, they include that the Kaiser would keep some, some of the land they took. Right. And, 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 and they'll bring up that in the Kaiser's initial proposal, he didn't even mention giving up gains in Belgium or France. I don't even know if that's true, but let's grant it. Let's just grant it. Okay, honey. They're offering peace talks. They're offering peace talks. Now, in their initial gambit, yeah, they didn't mention giving up any ground. Okay. Maybe they would. Maybe they would give up their gains in the West if you would just fucking talk. What the hell is wrong with these psychos in these Western countries where they won't even talk? They use the fact that the Kaiser's not willing to give up land in his opening proposals to just have a talk. Oh, he's not willing to give up ground, so we won't even talk. We won't even try to ask him if he's willing to give up ground, right? And the thing is, years later, by 1918, these same leaders, they're lamenting the deaths from the war, you know, whatever it was, like... 600,000 Tommies, you know, however many were killed. You know, you know the order of magnitude that it was. Okay, but you guys wouldn't even talk to the Germans about a conditional settlement six months into the war. Pro and that's what we know of because they were trying to talk to Wilson to try to get some sort of talk with the West in February of 1915. They were probably trying before even then Right. So, and remember, the war started in August of 1914. The Germans were trying to work by, by February. The Germans were trying to work to the Americans to get some contact with the French and the British. OK, and then they go on lamenting the deaths from this war. <laughs> you know, the, the, the my brother in Christ meme, you literally wouldn't even talk to the Germans. You literally wouldn't even sit down and say, Maybe try to work this out. Maybe try to work this to try to stop this unfolding disaster. You know, <laughs> see, 
this is where British, American, and NATO involvement in any war, it always smells of a fucking rat. Right? Because think about this. Okay, so why did what was the, the nominal technical reason for Britain entering the war against the German Empire? It was it was for, to protect Belgium, right? Now, really, we know that's not the true motivating force for Britain getting into the war. But that was the technical reason. Right. That was that was sort of the the straw that broke the camel's back, that took the split war cabinet. And that's what the, and that was something that they could sell to the public. Oh, Belgium, poor, poor, poor Belgium. OK, Belgium. So the British Empire, these people, they really care about Belgium. Wow. They really care about Belgium. Amazing, amazing levels of care for Belgium. OK. So the whole reason, right, legally, technically, the reason you're going into this war is Belgium. Okay? And it's to protect Belgium. It's to protect the territorial integrity and the sovereignty of Belgium. Because there was an agreement signed in like 1848 or something that they had to do that. Okay? Why not talk to the Germans... To maybe sign some sort of agreement to that effect. To say, hey, so long as you don't attack Belgium, we, the British Empire, will stay out of the war. You know, hey, I mean, that would be a way to protect Belgium. And what's amazing to me is that nobody ever brings up the fact that Britain didn't do anything to actually protect Belgium. Right? Everyone, you know, everyone talks about, oh, here's what the Germany should have done. Here's what Kaiser Wilhelm should have done, you know, including me to some extent. But we, but they treat Britain like there's some animal which had to enter the war. It had no choice. Oh, Germany attacked Belgium. I guess that means half a million Britons have to die and we must bankrupt the empire. You know, as far as I know. There wasn't even attempt. There wasn't even an attempt to get the Germans to pull out of Belgium in exchange for Britain agreeing to not enter this war. There you go. There's your solution to getting the Germans out of Belgium. There's there's a way for you to protect Belgium, right, and to preserve Belgian neutrality. <laughs> and frankly, the fact that the Brits, instead of actually doing anything to try to resolve the Belgian problem. The supposed reason for actually entering the war, you know, by obviously threatening to enter on one hand, offering a non-intervention on the other if the Germans left Belgium. To get the Germans to leave Belgium. But the fact that the British didn't, didn't do hardly anything to try to actually protect Belgium is evidence that the German general staff was correct in their assessment that Britain was bound to enter the war no matter what. So the Germans might as well invade Belgium to go around those forts keep the war in France and end up seizing something about a third of France's pre-war industrial capacity and hold it for basically the duration of the war, right? Britain's behavior regarding Belgium is evidence that the Germans were right and that the Germans were right, quote, sort of, to, to invade Belgium, I guess. You know, you know I, again, this is not something where we give our stamp of approval. Good, good on you, Kaiser. Invade those Belgians, right? That's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the Germans were right about the British. The, pa the path that the Brits actually took by actually entering the war, you know, with the knock-on effect of persuading Italy to enter the war, because Italy wasn't going to join if it was just France and Russia. That path guaranteed Belgium would be occupied the longest. What the British Empire did was the path that was the worst for Belgium. If Britain just hadn't entered the war, if Britain literally just did not honor their treaty, the war would have been over sooner. 99% chance Italy wouldn't have entered the war. France probably would have been knocked out. Maybe maybe within the first year, maybe maybe the they would have actually been able to take Paris. Maybe the British the British expeditionary force was all that that saved Paris, but I think that even if even if the France were, French were able to hold Paris without British intervention, I think the Germans would have taken it eventually anyway. But 
but either way, Belgium Belgium is cleared earlier, right? Because the war ends earlier. So um, anyway, that's uh that's sort of the preamble to what I'm going to be talking about regarding regarding the Nazis here. So let's look at look at chat. What is what is chat saying? What's chat saying? I will invade the Belgians. Let's invade Belgium. How dare those Belgians exist? Belgians are very close to Germans by FST distance. <laughs> yes. Well, you can just look at them. Um, let, okay. I'm going to read a few uh, white power chats here. Also, entropy. I need to look at the entropy. Can people do the entropy? Scroll. $3, anonymous. Ryan, what geographic location in the United States do you think white should, try, should live? Um, I think you should try to go for um, Wyoming, Montana, and the Dakotas. And to a lesser extent, Idaho. That's my, that's my view. Uh, Azracool for $10. Have you researched raw animal product-based diet, a so-called pri primal diet? Uh, no, I have not. Winston... Weston A. Price documented some interesting divergences in dental outcomes, such as less prominent forward facial development and inaccurate growth of teeth from the new diet. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't really subscribe to any particular diet. I'm a fan of, of periodic fasting, and I think you should. I'm a fan of periodic fasting and sort of avoiding grains you know don't eat too much grain um if you have if you have an addiction to grain which is a real thing an addiction to sugar especially is a real thing um frankly i think it would be like one way to fight addiction is to actually replace it with another addiction um so and an addiction to starch and sugar is probably one of the worst addictions you can have. There's maybe a few hard drugs that are worse than an addiction to starch and sugar. I think an addiction to starch and sugar is worse than an addiction to caffeine. Um, and I also think, and I also believe it's worse than an addiction than an addiction to nicotine. Practically speaking, right now, when I when I say that, people, of course, they have a huge. There's a huge opposition to nicotine because smoking cigarettes is extremely unhealthy right because nicotine uh, excuse me cigarettes are full of tar and stuff um but nicotine itself i don't know maybe I, i'll do another video on this basically the 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 nicotine defense video not it's not really because nicotine's still bad for you but it's like in 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 terms of the doses that people actually consume nicotine in, it's gonna, it's, it's very similar to caffeine in its negative effects. In terms of the doses that people actually consume, because when you consume like a, I forget how much caffeine is in like a cup of coffee, it's like 150 milligrams, whereas with uh, nicotine products, you're typically getting like single digit milligrams of nicotine. So nicotine is obviously the fatal dose of nicotine is is a lot. Um, smaller than for caffeine, but the amount that you actually consume if you're a nicotine consumer is like an order of magnitude lower as well. So practically speaking, nicotine alone is about as damaging as caffeine. What's really damaging is smoking a bunch of tar into, into your lungs, right? And that, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. Um, how did I go off on that rant based on this comment about the primal diet? I don't Look, I try to avoid diet stuff. Just eat. I, I'm. I like eat a balanced diet. And what's going to matter for like longevity is not going to be anything dietary anyway. At least not that we know of. It's going to be. It's going to be like wonder pills. It's going to be things like um, NMN and NR. Um, I have like a list here. Um, Sulfurophane, um, fisetin, quercetin, apinogen, right? uh, and the, the, the senolytics, things that deal with, with cellular health. And these are going to be supplements, right? Because people have been eating healthy forever and everyone. People have been eating healthy and have been exercising since the beginning of time, and they've all died, 
right? So the way to stop this this disease of aging is gonna it's not. I'm not saying to not eat healthy and exercise. Don't get me wrong. Certainly, you can have you can have a really horrible life if you're obese and and sedentary. But in, in terms of <laughs> ultimately, what's gonna have to happen to to solve the disease of aging is something a lot more than good health and ex good diet and exercise anyway um sorry I'm, I'm getting on so should i eat dirt um depends on the dirt probably wouldn't be the worst thing for you um nmn is pointless nice cinnamide does everything just as good i i disagree but whatever i fine take both I say take 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 all take all of these these anti-aging drugs, which you know back, you know eleven years ago these were things that I was listening to something from Aubrey Duguere. He was talking about this stuff like theoretically he was talking about the buildup of senescent cells and how we have no way to deal with that, and, and he was talking about these senolytics and like this very theoretical abstract thing, and then like um, ten years ago. And, and then and then today, like recently, these stuffers now not not only are they available, but they're available in a non asshole way. Because there's a lot of stuff that's available, but it's but but the FDA is is an asshole about it, and they say you have to get a prescription from a doctor, which means and of course prescription from a doctor. What does that mean? That means some asshole idiot doctor who doesn't know anything, who doesn't re who hasn't researched anything since medical school, is going to go. Well, what acute condition do you uh, need this this thing for? Why exactly do you need this this NMN thing? What is the what is the the condition that we can write here that this is a treatment for? And like doctors who are like that, I want to fucking strangle them and say I have a condition called the human condition. It's called aging, and I want to cure it. You asshole. But anyway, <laughs> so, sorry. Um, all right. So get back on to onto onto my thing. Pull up my notes again here. Um, uh, did you check the archive? It's also in his... Oh, sorry. Um, okay, German military aggression. German military aggression. World War One. So, um, let's find a new map here. So, talked about scores... You know, and how like you can do BS stuff with like minutiae. Um, we can avoid just stupid scuttlebutt, like especially personal memoirs. Fuck your personal memoirs. You know, I cited something out of some guy's biography, but the thing is, I was citing that because he's he's reporting a specific event that he says actually happened right in what's his face graham's autobiography and i don't think he's a lying about that specific event now i'm not using his autobiography to say oh this is the the exact date in which it happened who knows maybe his memory's wrong okay but like people lean on memoirs and diaries way too much right and more so with the nazis than any anyone else right anyone else when they, they read something from churchill they'll take it with a grain of salt but when Hitler writes in something in Mein Kampf about like, like how he thinks the Poles are, are apes or simian or something, whatever the hell he wrote about the Poles when, when he was in prison, you know, they take that with like a kind of deadly seriousness, something that they would not do for anyone else, right? So that's, but anyway, so I stay away from that stuff. So... And you know, and the thing is, just to counter on this, on this, on what I call scuttlebutt, there was plenty of anti-German scuttlebutt even before Hitler came to power, before what was called World War II ever began. You know, I'm sure you've seen the proposals that Germany must be aggressively attacked um, and be wiped off the map. Why? Well, because there was some guy in Germany who was maybe in the army command, or maybe he was a high level recognized intellectual and he drew a map of some great big german empire that that went out to here right some guy drew a map on a piece of paper of germany ruling all this or something 
Or maybe maybe he just drew a map that literally had the world and he just colored the whole world one color and labeled it Germany or something. You know? Well, there you go. <laughs> you know? You know, and the same thing, but the problem, the same thing can be said literally about every country. You know, there are maps, there, there are like people in the Italian high command who were talking about, well, here's how we're going to form greater Rome. We're going to, we're going to take over Spain. We're going to take over the South. Of, we're going to partition France with Germany, take over Yugoslavia and take over Greece. Now, as it happened, military reality was that Italy ended up stumbling into those as requirements anyway. Um, there's some... I don't know if you'd call it moral justification, but some strategic justification to invade Greece. But the, the, the point is that, like, okay, so was Italy trying to take over the rest of the south of France? Were they trying to take over Spain? Like, these things, like, they always exist for any state, and they're only being used against Germany. You know, the, and the United States had, and as far as I know, still do have, war plans to invade Canada, Right? There was some group of uh, DOD big shots who cre created this document. They called it the Project for a New American Century. Um, the Italian government had war plans to invade Spain, Balkans, you know. <sighs> Nothing came of Italian war plans except by happenstance. Um, so basically war plans to invade literally everyone, some grandiose designs of great empire. These are things that exist in every state at every time. Sometimes events come to pass where they're quasi justified in doing bits and pieces of what someone wrote of a great big empire somewhere. Okay. Such as, in my opinion, the German invasion of Poland and especially the German invasion of the USSR, which I think was quite justified. But these things are not unique either to Imperial or Nazi Germany. But beyond Scuttlebutt, there is one argument that I want to talk about. And this is um th this is one argument that I hear a lot. And I call this the MIFO myth. The MIFO myth. So um so the MIFO myth, I, I don't know if you guys have heard of heard of the MIFO myth. This is well, I call it the Mifel myth, but it's basically Germany's economy was overheating. It was headed to a fiscal cliff. It was about it was coming apart at the seams. Hitler had to have a war in order to shift Germany to a war economy, cancel debts, pillage, conquer territories to to, to save to save the German economy. Basically, German economies needed to flip the switch into a war economy in order to prevent a collapse. That's, that's, I call it this, the MIFO myth, um, re reference to the MIFO bills. Now, Germany's, um, GNP, not GDP, but I'm assuming that GDP and GNP are going to be close enough. And when orders of magnitude that we're talking about, it's not going to matter. In 1938 was 100.2 billion, uh, marks, Reichsmarks, empire marks. Um, let me see if I can't find. I have it open somewhere. It's bloody Sunday. Look at this. Look at this obnoxious. <laughs> this is the, a semi-important. I don't know if I'll even read through this, but like, look at this. What are you thinking, guy? <laughs> don't make your page like. Uh, Sunday. Where's the? It's somewhere. Did I? Did I not have this open? It's military spending. Did I not have this open? I don't have this open. God damn it. All right. Well, this one. Okay. Let me try to. For you guys. Maybe. Maybe it'll open. Uh, okay, here we go. Which one was it? I think it was not here, not here, not here, here. So this is, what was this? Speaking, problem is this is all in Neanderthal English. So, so year, um, 
This is okay. This is GDP. Okay. No. Okay. This is the GDP. This is this is their the uh, GDP right here. I don't know what this is. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know. Maybe this may be another measure of GDP or GNP or something. But anyway, so it's like 100.2 and 38, 109.3. Okay. Um, what was the debt? Here's the okay. Here's 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 the debt. And I'm I'm just being being a Wikipedia believer here. Uh, let's see. Billion. Okay. Well, I have it, and it's basically. Okay, here we go. Okay, whereas government expenditures thus causing a huge deficit and a rising national debt, reaching 38 billion Reichsmarks in 1939. 38 billion! Neat. Okay, what's the GDP in 39? 109.3. What's the debt to GDP ratio or GNP ratio? 30 I did this 34.86 percent <laughs> okay so um what's this I have some other things looking at the debt to GDP ratio for the the United States so th this is an obnoxious graph but you can sort of eyeball it so pre-war this is the war pre-war Okay, what is that? Like 40%? So pretty similar, right? U.S. has have a pretty similar debt to Nazi Germany. What's France? This is what I could find on France. Unfortunately, it's not as proximate as I would like it to be, but I think it gives us some idea. Um, where was it? Stop with your freaking words. All these authors, they write so many words. I just want to see your, your tables. We should, we should ban words on papers. Um, okay, here we go. Is this it? Yeah, here we go. Public debt in francs as share of GDP in percentage. Okay. 81. 70, 72, 78, 87, 97. This is from 28 to 33. I wish this was more proximate. I wish this was, you know, we could get to the 37, 38, 39. But safe it to say, France had a much bigger debt load than Germany, even though Germany was doing the whole Versailles repayment. Now, I wonder if actually the, uh, the reparations disciplined the German public that it that it made sort of a, a greater public tolerance for for not having such nice things not having such not because you know if your government has is having to pay like half of their budget for these reparations even though germany ultimately didn't really pay those reparations they still paid a, a lot um perhaps perhaps this is why they were so disciplined like they couldn't afford they couldn't run you know domestic public debt because they had to pay these reparations and so that's just a theory about that. that. That's not here or there to like the, the war aggression thesis, but basically, you know, whose economy was falling apart? Germany's? Why? Oh, they were in t and they were bankrupt, right? I, he I hear people say this. Germany was bankrupt. Bankrupt? Where's the 30, 34.86% was, was Germany's. Damn it. 34.86% in 1939, right? Far less than the U.S.'s debt to GDP. I don't even know what the U.S.'s debt to GDP ratio. Two times? <laughs> Something ridiculous. So, um, what was... Oh, and here's the U.K. Whose economy was falling apart? Who, who was bankrupt? Oh, here we go. Uh, U.K. national debt since 1900. United Kingdom fiscal year 2002. Um... 
Here we go. Okay, this is this is better. This is where we can actually see like the, the thing. Oh wow, they're doing pretty. They're doing all right. Look, here we go. Before World War One, the UK's debt to GDP ratio was actually a little bit better than that of Nazi Germany. Right, <laughs> but then World War One. Okay, so how are they as we get proximate to the war? Okay, they're paying it down. They're doing well. 1940, they're still paying it down, but then, okay. But what was it in sort of the run-up to the war? What was their debt-to-GDP ratio? 179, 74, 66. So they are paying it down, good for them. But this idea, oh, Hitler needs a war because he's bankrupt. <laughs> and the funny thing about that, that what I call the MIFO myth, that was not something that was ever said at the time. Now, that's, that is a total retcon. Mentions of Germany being bankrupt and so he needs a war. That came... One, at, the, I've, I've heard mentions of it once the war started, but I've heard no mentions of it before the war. Right? That is a complete retcon. That is a complete after-the-fact narrative yarn that they were bankrupt. So no, Germany at the time had a, had a, had a very low debt level. So... Um, yeah, the Nazi economy is overheating. Oh my God, they're heading off a cliff. They need a war to bail them out. Nobody was saying that at the time. It was a narrative made up in retrospect. Um, so, or another thing. So another thing before getting into like Chechia and Poland is really what we're going to be talking about for the for the early evidence of of aggression. Um, military expenditures. Germany was armed to the teeth. They were armed to the teeth. They were, they were spending everything on arms. What's funny is despite spending all this on arms, they were in way less debt than, than, the, than, the, than, the, than, the, than the responsible democracies because we all know how responsible democracies are and how irresponsible dictators are, right? So despite all this, all this military spending, they were, and despite coming off of having to pay, you know, some fraction of the Versailles reparations. They never paid all of it, but some fraction of it. Despite all that, they're in less debt and they're spending way more on arms. Wow. <laughs> wow, it sure looks like Hitler is a much better steward of the economy than the democracies. But anyway. But, oh, but, but in terms of aggression, in terms of aggression, what's the aggression here? So USSR... Spending all these millions on arms. Take, you know, USSR spending on arms in monetary terms. I always take that, you know, as kind of an estimate because, like, what USSR, what's money, what are exchange rates, what's a ruble really worth, you know, who knows. But I think this gives some crude idea, like attempts to try to monetize Thing, attempts to monetize the Soviet Union are always somewhat perilous, but I think the magnitude paints a picture. And this is what Germany's looking at. And this is the... God damn it. This is the... This is the, this, the reality of what Germany's looking at. Because who's who is between... Wh where's the USSR? Here, here's Germany. Who's between the USSR and Germany? A bunch of weak states that can't... that can't alone or even in a compact defeat the USSR, okay? They, they, they won't. I don't know if you can look into like population and economic data on Poland and Romania. They're not up to the task of defeating the USSR. They're, just, they're, they're not. And however backward you think communism is or whatever, sure, whatever. They had a, they had a extremely competent and overwhelming war economy. Okay. And they were very proficient in war. So, yeah, <laughs> that's what Germany's looking at. So basically, this, this hysteria about German armament is that Germany and the USSR were in an arms race and the West wasn't invited. And that's always the context. And the thing is, when you see these, these things... Where they say, look at how much Germany is spending on arms compared to France and Britain up until around 1939 when, when the gaps close. 
which you can't see here um, in the, which somewhere. Yeah, you don't see that here because it stops in 38. But by 39, British arms begin to take, French and British arms begin to take off. But, you know, they'll use this to say, look, Germany was planning on wars of aggression against someone other than the USSR is basically the idea. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. But like, like this is the, the strategic reality that Germany was facing. It was the Soviet Union. And if there was any, and any real Soviet threat, if it was going to be contained by anyone, it was going to be Germany. Like that's just the reality. That's the, that's the geo, that's the the geographic reality because geographic geo, geographically Germany is somewhat close to the USSR, but it's the economic reality because Poland and Romania and certainly not the Baltic states are not up to snuff to deal with the USSR. So that's that's just the, the strategic reality is Germany is going to be is going to have to be dealing with the USSR, hopefully through deterrence, hopefully through a, a kind of cold war, right? But if worse comes to worst, a hot war, right? That's that. This is the world the Nazi regime was actually looking at and was actually responding to. And also, the fact that this was Hitler's focus, that Hitler's military armament was a product of the USSR's military armament. You know, the evidence of that is, of course, in his statements, but... Beyond that, and there's also his later peace proposals to the West are evidence of that, but there's even evidence of this before, before the war. And that is in the Navy. The German Navy, there's some evidence of Germany's strategic thinking to be oriented against the Soviet Union in the German Navy. During the Great War, as you know, Germany had the high seas fleet. It's a big navy. Some, uh, something about any, depending on how you measure it. If you measure tonnage or something, it was between a half and two thirds. I don't recall exactly, but the Germans had a high seas fleet. It wasn't as big as the Royal Navy. The high seas fleet was not particularly effective. Fought a few battles. Supposedly they won. The British say they won, but it didn't matter. The British were able to maintain the blockade. The high seas fleet was basically useless. What was incredibly useful was the German U-boat fleet. German U in fact, the German U-boats were more effective in World War I than they were in World War II, despite the Germans not controlling France. And that was because the British didn't have really hardly any anti-submarine measures at this time. Okay. So it doesn't take much imagination to determine in a second war with Britain, if Germany was, if Germany here is planning on a second war with Britain, what should Germany focus on? I think it's pretty obvious. U-boats. That's what worked in the First World War. Why not build U-boats for the second? Why are you trying to why are you trying to build a second high seas fleet? Because that's what the Nazi regime was doing. They, they weren't building a fleet of U-boats with a few surface fleets for like coastal patrol duties or whatever. They weren't orienting towards U-boats. They were orienting towards the surface, surface fleet. They built the Sharnors, Serpents, Bismarck, right? Germany focused on the surface fleet. What use <laughs> would such a surface fleet have against Britain? We, I mean, they knew in World War I it, it was useless. In World War II, it ended up being mostly useless except for one operation. It enabled them to, to conduct one operation, Norway. But other than that, it was useless. And Norway ended up not being particularly important once the Germans conquered France. Okay, reason Norway was important was because of, it's not on here, but way up north there's a port Narvik. And during the winter months, the Baltic freezes over, and all of the iron ore... Basically, half of Germany's iron ore came, comes from an area uh, before they conquered France. Came from an area in Sweden called the Karuna. That had to go out of the port of Narvik, which was in Norway um, during during winter. 
because the Baltic froze over, but the North Sea was not frozen over. So um, now what the British were doing, not only were the British sending ships into Norwegian waters and sinking um, German convoys, um, Altmark was one, I believe there were others. Altmark was like the big trigger incident. But more importantly, the British actually had, and it's debatable how far along the British were in this, and what exactly the, the British invasion of Norway would entail as Plan K. Was it going to be a full-on occupation and invasion of the whole of Norway, or was it just going to be sending a force to occupy the port of Narvik, which is what mattered? Hard to say. Now, this ended up not being important in the end because Germany took France. And France, at the time, had something like two-thirds the iron ore production of the United States. This is what people, people don't realize that at this time, France was one of the leading iron producers in the world. Germany was one of the leading coal producers in the world. And Nazi Germany had all that once they conquered France. So the strategic importance of Norway, i.e. the port of Narvik, kind of evaporated after the fall of France. So, um, And that is why I think the British never really took with much zest to invading Norway, even though Norway, by, by like 1943, Norway is a pretty exposed thing. And it seems like the British could invade Norway pretty easily. The reason they didn't is because it's strategically not important because they had the iron from France. Anyway, um, that's a bit of a tangent. Germany's building a surface fleet. Why are they building a surface fleet if they know they're gonna go to war with Britain? Well, it's because they don't know they're going to go to war with Britain. They're building a surface fleet because they're going to go to war with the Soviet Union and they're going to be fighting in the Baltic Sea. Okay? And they're building a fleet in response to that reality, to control of the Baltic. And this surface fleet that the Germans had, despite facing some losses at the hands of the British, this surface fleet was able to control the Baltic up until like the... For the whole war right the germans never lost control of the baltic even when the soviets were advancing into east prussia the soviets couldn't do amphibious invasions from once they took the baltic they couldn't do amphibious invasions through the baltic and up up in here because the germans maintained naval supremacy through the entirety of the war right until the soviets were literally taking port facilities and the fleet literally had nowhere to port but <laughs> but it worked the German Navy, in the role that it was designed for, that is to control the Baltic, succeeded. The surface fleet, I mean. Even though German naval production eventually shifted mostly to U-boats, and which sort of starved the surface fleet, even this starved and nerfed surface fleet continued to perform this task adequately. So this is more evidence of, you know, that Hitler's orientation was towards the USSR, is in the Navy, and what the Navy was doing. Um... So there's two schools of thought here regarding Germany's focus on a surface fleet as opposed to U-boats. One, Eric Rader was a mouth-breathing moron who didn't learn a single lesson from World War I and that he was totally taken in by the mystique of the big gun battleship, by the glorious, sexy, big, big, you know, multi-penis ships battleships, big, big guns, big dicks shooting hard, you know, that he was really taken by that, sort of the, the, the grandeur of the, of, the, of the surface battle fleet, right, that, and that he was planning to challenge the Royal Navy head on with a relatively far smaller fleet than the Germans had in 1914. The British also had a smaller fleet, but relatively it was greater than the, than the high seas fleet was. Or... Raiders' naval development program had nothing to do with Britain. Another piece of evidence of this is that the Anglo-German Naval Agreement signed in, the, in June of 1935 limited Germany's naval tonnage to 35% of Britain's. So they're agreeing to... So here's what the Germans are... The German Navy is, is doing, right? They're agreeing to a much smaller fleet than Britain. Okay. One, they're building a surface fleet instead of U-boats, right? When U-boat, whereas U-boats, you know, 
U-boats still have some effectiveness, even if you have overall naval inferiority. That's why the Germans love them, because, because they, they have naval inferiority, but also want to strike at Britain somehow. And U-boats basic, were basically the only way they could do that. But that's not what they're building, right? So, yeah. Um, and we also know that in hindsight, that the Ger Germans did not have any well-developed plans for the invasion of France. Um, and they did not have it. And the invasions of Denmark and Norway were um, famously slapdash. That's something that's that you can look into. You know, even even Orthodox documentaries talking about the German invasion of Denmark and Norway point out just how quickly and thrown together the invasion plans were. And that's probably to a large extent why they succeeded it's because it was such a such a crazy idea that that on sea, the Germans would transport troops over the sea like we own the sea we have all the ships the british we have all the ships and the germans are landing troops here all across the holy shit right it's kind of, it was kind of crazy that the germans would even engage in such an operation that was so dependent on naval supply when the when the british empire when the royal navy is like right here um but they did and it worked and i think it worked simply because it was so unexpected anyway um so okay so here's where we come to the beginning of Hitler's supposed aggression. There are some psychos who say, like, Hitler should have been stopped at the Rhineland. Hitler should have been stopped at Austria. Aust Hit you know, there's even some people today, amazingly, who believe that Austria was, like, strong-armed into, into the Reich. The reality is that Austrians volunteered and joined the SS at like, the same rate as the rest of Germany. This myth that the Austrians were forced into Germany against their will, or it was a sham election. I mean, it probably was a sham election, but but, but it's a total myth. Austrians were as on board with the whole Nazi program as the rest of Germany. You know, incidentally, Hitler was an Austrian. Like, shut up. Like, that's... But anyway. Um... But here we come to, to Hitler's real supposed aggression, and that is that is Chechia, or Czechoslovakia, as as they called it. Um, Czechoslovakia. There's not much to talk about Munich. I'm not really going to talk about Munich because that was a treaty Hitler signed with Britain and France to take the Sudeti from from Chechia. Signed treaty. Area is like 90 plus percent German, the Sudeti area. So in terms of ethnic composition, in terms of the um, desire of the people there, they all wanted to become part of Nazi Germany. Um, and by and by any legal standard, that was all above board. So there's not really a whole lot to talk there. There's, you know, it was signed off on the treat the the Sudeti. Now, what's not mentioned very much about a lot of this is that in the old uh, Austro-Hungarian kingdom, what is now the Czech Republic, Bohemia and Moravia, this was sort of the hub of uh, the industrial planning of the, uh, of the Habsburg Empire um, as part of their sort of national industrial plan, which is something that countries tend to do. The United States doesn't really have like industrial plans much anymore. But back then, and especially for a country like Austria-Hungary, they did industrial planning. And as part of their industrial planning was basically Bohemia and Moravia were going to be a chief industrial zone. So capital from the rest of the empire flowed into Bohemia and Moravia to, to, to build the factories there. But it doesn't matter, right? Because it's all, I mean, it's all part of the Habsburg Empire, empire, quote unquote. It's all, you know, those factories, just because they happen to be in Bohemia, I mean, they're, they're producing, for example, war armaments that are used by Hungarian soldiers, Slovakian soldiers, you know, Croatian soldiers, German soldiers in, in Austria-Hungary. So it, it didn't really matter that, I believe it was something like 80% of the industrial capacity of the Austrian half of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was actually in Bohemia. Okay, so, so so whenever you hear 
like right once Chechia later i'm skipping ahead a little bit but once Chechia was quasi annexed by germany that they end up pulling out a lot of these industries out of bohemia and moravia they go oh that's terrible they're stealing their factories okay keep in mind that the state of czechoslovakia stole the majority of the industrial capacity of the haps of the austro-hungarian empire right industrial capacity that whose initial starting capital came primarily from austria okay so a little bit of context before like whinging about factories from from bohemian moravia that are being pulled out so Sudeti, not much to talk about here. Um, it was ethnically German, has a history of being part of, you know, has a history of being a part of Germany, right? Big Germany, greater Germany, in terms of these two empires both being basically Germany ish. It was signed off by the West, not much to talk about there. Now, I saw something on Quora. This is kind of a tangent. I was on Quora. I saw an amazing argument, amazing argument. And this is that the Munich agreement that the German taking of Sudeti, this was an invalid agreement. Why? Why was it an invalid agreement? I shit you not, this commenter said, because it was an agreement signed under duress. The Czechs didn't have any real ability to resist this treaty. It was invalid because it was a treaty signed under duress. <laughs> Wait, I don't know. Uh, let me look at the, the, the comments here. Like, does anyone... Do I need to even, like... Describe that it was a treaty design. <laughs> it was a treaty signed under duress. These people, <laughs> these people. I, I mean, okay. I mean, okay. A treaty signed under duress. What is Czechoslovakia? Czechoslovakia is literally a country created by a treaty signed under maximum duress. Total duress. The, the very exist okay whatever um so and here's another thing this is some scuttlebutt that's that's come up with later um i don't know if you've seen those documentaries where they say um at munich hitler was mad he was mad that chamberlain caved because well hitler wanted a war and this is just, this is not, um, I don't know who said, whose diary this was in, or said, Hitler was mad because Hitler wanted a war. Hitler was mad that the West folded because he wanted to invade Czechoslovakia. He wanted people to die. He wanted this, this guy who spent four years in World War I and literally prohibited any use of poison gas, which Germany was the world leader in, that never manifested in the war because Hitler prohibited its use in the battlefield ever, because he was because Hitler was so opposed to the use of poison gas, even against the even against the Soviet Union, right? His supposed you know mortal enemy that he was willing to go into a total death struggle against, he never used poison and gas, not even against the Soviet Union. Right, this man. Oh, he wanted he wanted a war in nineteen thirty eight against Czechoslovakia. Yeah, he was mad that he didn't get his war. <laughs> I, I anyway. So okay, so after Sudeti, what's going on in Czechoslovakia? It's still Czechoslovakia at this point. It's not yet Czechia. Well, um, some things happen, and I'm surprised. This is actually an image from Wikipedia, so I'm 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 stunned that they would actually. I'm stunned that Wikipedia would would show this, 
because they show sort of an order of things. Um, well, we'll talk about five and six in a bit, but because what they show is at first they're Sudeti, okay, that's one. Two, Poland goes into this area, Poland goes into Chechen, okay, that's two. Then Hungary goes into here, takes this little Hungar ethnically Hungarian strip here. Um, I think Hungary overclaimed. I think there's an area sort of down here that's not really Hungarian, but in the grand scheme of things, whatever. Um, four, um, the state of Ruthenia. The, the, the people of Ruthenia declared their independence from Czechoslovakia and became an independent state. And then Hungary um, invaded and didn't last very long. Now, what's interesting is it was unprovoked aggression against people who want self-determination in Hungary. They just invade? How dare they? You know, like, it's funny, the the um, the Hungarian invasion of Ruthenia, I don't, like, people don't even know that. People don't even know that happened. And yet, like, it's, it's a thing that happened and it's supposedly, like, unprovoked aggression or whatever. Um, but I guess Hungary getting bigger doesn't really upset the balance of power, so nobody cares. Um, <clears throat> now then, five and six. This is where it's a little bit muddy. And because Wikipedia, they're saying that Hitler... Here's what Wikipedia is saying. Hitler is say, uh, Wikipedia is saying Hitler sets up the protectorate, and then Slovakia becomes independent. The order of events here is muddy and the reason i say that is because of what because when hacha goes to berlin um now okay so on the hacha's trip to berlin first there's this claim and you see this in documentaries that hitler summoned hacha to berlin now i don't know what this means right summoned and I hear this all the time. Hitler, some like this. This is uh, like a like more petty propaganda. Like Hitler, so, what does summon even mean? Hacha was at the moment, at this time, wouldn't be for very long. But at this time, he was the president of a sovereign state, Czechoslovakia, kind of a fictional Versailles one, but one that existed on the map nonetheless. So Hitler could call Hacha and say, "Come to Berlin." Okay, and Hacha could come. Or Hacha could not come. Hitler could also call Mussolini on the phone and tell him to do the Macarena. Then Mussolini could do the Macarena. Or not. Or whatever. So, <laughs> so summoned. Shut up. <laughs> um, the second idea is that Hitler made Hacha wait for two hours to try to make him sweat it out before the negotiations. Hacha himself denied this, but like, but it's petty, like whatever. Let's say Hitler did this, made Hacha sweat it out before the negotiations for two hours. Hacha waits for two hours. Honestly, if Hacha's coming to Berlin, a two hour wait, like, okay, whatever. I don't think it's true, but, but remember, the trip to Berlin was Hacha's idea. According to Hacha, right? Hacha himself says, I did this on my own accord. Hitler didn't summon me. Now, even if Hitler summoned and then made Hacha wait for two hours, okay, whatever. Like, that's that that's kind of petty, but whatever, fine. Like, it's... It, it, we're, we're talking about a madman trying to conquer the world. These are trivial snipes. You know, even if they're true, it's like, who cares? But... um. And these are this is all scuttlebutt that Hacha and his ha and his daughter deny. Um, one thing that is true, and this is from notes of the meeting that exist, and they're available online. Um, I had them, I don't have them now. Hacha's first proposal to Hitler was to just protect Chechia. Um, and this actually goes back to Chechia's uh, to Czechoslovakia's problems after the Munich Agreement. Because after the Munich Agreement, um, who's who's protecting Czechoslovakia now? Um, because Czechoslovakia 
they made overtures to everyone. They even made an overture to the Soviet Union, which they had a nominal alliance with. But basically, they made an overture to, the, to Stalin, and Stalin said hello, even though they're supposedly allied, but Stalin, but not. Anyway, the, the Czechoslovak Soviet Union situation is a little bit not whatever. Stalin wasn't going to protect Czechoslovakia. That's the, that's the short of it. Um, France did not. Britain did not. It was France and Britain who said, hey, Czechoslovakia, give up the Sudeti to Hitler. Oh, and then, and then Czechoslovakia does so dutifully complies to that treaty. And then Pacha tries to get the French and the British to protect him. They say, no, no, we're not going to protect you. Nope. We're not going to commit ourselves to that. Like, okay. Um, amazingly, they even seek protection from Poland, which no, because, because remember Poland wants, Poland is thinking they're going to get Slovakia. Po, po, the Polish leadership are a bunch of retards, as you'll see later. Um, but they're, but, but early signs of their tardation is seen here where they don't protect Czech, Czechoslovakia and they said, try to take Chechen. And they're thinking we're going to take Slovakia. No. <laughs> so, so basically Czechoslovakia has nobody to protect them and Hungary and Poland are, are carving them up. Another problem is that the Slovaks are not particularly interested in fighting for the state. They're having mutinies in the army. Um, so that is the context of Hacha's trip to Berlin. And what is true... Now, the thing is, Hacha had sent multiple requests to Germany to guarantee Czechoslovakia's independence. Germany kept saying no. And you can say, oh, that's Hitler's aggression. He wouldn't guarantee the independence of Czechoslovakia. Okay, well, neither would Italy, France, or Britain. Neither would anybody else. So what are you picking on? So, so that's not something unique to Germany, that they would not commit their armed forces to whatever foibles this, this uh, monstrosity of Versailles may, may get itself into. Basically, Germany was not committing itself to go to war with Poland to protect Czechoslovakia. That's what it boiled down to. Neither was Britain. Neither was France, neither was Italy. So, shut up about that. Um, so, basically, Hacha goes to Berlin, and Hacha's opening gambit in the negotiations is uh, protect us. Right? We remain independent. Protect us. Now, this is why I sort of disagree with the, with the, the, the numbers here. Um, five and six that first the protector was set up and then Slovakia became independent. I sort of disagree because when Hacha was in Berlin, he was asking Hitler to protect not Czechoslovakia. He was asking Hitler to protect Bohemia and Moravia, Czechia. Okay. So in the negotiations on uh, March 14th, Hacha was already speaking and acting for all intents and purposes as if Slovakia was already independent of, of Czechia. He was acting as if this had already been done, even though I think officially the, the state wasn't proclaimed until like a few days later or something. But he was acting as if... So Hacha was acting... By the time he was at Berlin, Hacha was acting as if Slovakia was, for all intents and purposes, gone. So that's why I sort of agree with this. And I think this five, six order here is a little bit misleading because it, it, it's, I think it's nominally true, but it's not, but it's practically untrue. Practically Slovakia had been independent by the time Hacha makes its, makes his trip to, to Berlin. Maybe it wasn't official, but Hacha doesn't seem to have had much faith that Czechoslovakia was going to hold together. Um, so Hacha goes to Berlin, says, protect us. And Hitler says, no, we're not going to just protect you. You have to become a protectorate of Nazi Germany, right? You have to stop being this annoying, obnoxious little country, literally in the middle of us, right? We're, and, you know, I mean, again, it sort of goes back to like the strategic questions. Like, let's say, let's say you know, by the time Slovakia is independent, you got Poland, Hungary, what is the purpose of any armed forces of Chechia at this point? What's, what do you have a military for? 
The only direction that that military can be directed against is Germany. Unless you're going to, I don't know, you're going to try to reinvade Slovakia or something. That, like, so, and so why does Chechia, why, why would Hitler want Chechia to have a military? This is not something that you need to have your seal of approval on. But, but basically Hitler says, no, no, we're not going to give you an unconditional protection. Uh, you're going to become a protectorate. Now, what this protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia basically boiled down to was that Chechia would be mostly self-governing, but they would pay basically their cut of defense. And as we know, Germany was going to go in and correct the, um, the industrial imbalance caused by Versailles or basically the bulk of that of the Austro-Hungarian Empire's industrial base was concentrated in Bohemia and Moravia. And he and they would strip they would basically strip a good portion of that out. Not all of it, but a good portion of that was coming back. And and I say coming back because it because that industry was funded primarily by Austrian German capital, not Czech capital. So um but the thing is, Hatcha came to Berlin, and ha and the, and yes, Hatcha's opening gambit was not to become a protectorate. But the thing is, <sighs> here, okay, I think it's virtually certain that Hatcha knew something like a protectorate status was going to be what probably happened, and it did. Right. Because. Like. Because Hacha had already sent several requests to Germany to be protected. Germany kept turning them down. Same with every other country. So why would Hacha imagine that it would work just because he traveled to Berlin? I don't think I don't think Hacha believed that his opening gambit was going to work. I think Hacha was thinking, "Look, I'll give it one last shot. Maybe hit, who knows? Who who fucking knows? One in a million chance. If it's a greater than zero chance that Hitler will agree to just protect Chechia and not have che any any level of Chechia sovereignty be removed, you know, sure. If it, even if it's a one in a thousand chance, I'll I'll." Roll the dice on that. Who knows? May, maybe Hitler will agree, and check full and, and full Czech independence will be preserved. I think Hacha knew that was almost certainly not going to happen, but why not give it a try? And so that was his opening gambit. And then immediately, and this happened in the same day. This was not some long drawn out negotiation, which is, and the fact that the negotiations were so short is evidence that I think Hacha knew that. Chechia was going to become some sort of a protectorate of some sort, right? The fact that he agreed to it so fast. It's not like he went to Berlin and said, please protect us. And then Hitler said, no, you become a protectorate. Hacha wasn't stunned by this. What? what? How dare you? How dare you even propose such a thing? Right? Because Hacha knew. Hacha knew that the Czech state was done. Um, or at least Czechoslovakia was done and the Czech state was now in, in, in sort of a dubious, at least strategic situation. But the thing is, um, the idea that Hitler, one piece of evidence that's used that Hitler was planning to invade uh, Chechia anyway, eventually, is uh, troop movements. And what they'll point to, something correctly, is that there were German troop movements at this time. Problem is that the, is that the German troop movements were in Silesia and in this part of Sudeti, right? The German troop movements were all up here. Okay. So yeah, there were German troop, troop you know units were being you know brought up to to combat order and being sent to the border around, but they're being sent to the border around here. Okay, what's going on around here? Well, Poland is existing, and Poland is sending troops over into here, and Poland is taking territory that bumps right up against German territory. Okay? Now, German troops are not being 
brought up to combat order and being sent here, you know, sort of around like the, um, what is this, the Saxony area, the Bavaria area, or in Austria, right? If you're going to invade Chechia, right, you, you, you go, you encircle them. You have, you have these two jaws here, you go, boop, and then, and then maybe try to push up into here. It's a little further over here, but you do a quick boop here. Right, and then you, and it's, it's basically like they're, they're already pocketed at the beginning of the invasion. So you put your troops all around, but the Germans weren't doing that. The German troops were all up in here, right? Because, and I think, and I don't know for certain, but this seems to be a response to what Poland's doing in here. And not that it would be part of any Polish official government operation to go into Sudeti to try to take, but you know, if you're sending troops, into an area that they're not familiar with, maybe they're going to go over into, maybe some of them are going to pop over here. You don't know, right? <laughs> I mean, troops do things, people do things. Officers don't know where they are. They may end up going in here and they may up, end up trying to set up Polish authority over in part of, part of Sudeti. Who knows? But that's where the German troops were. They weren't, basically the German troop disposition wasn't such that you would expect if they were planning to invade Chechia. And this to me is kind of ridiculous. Um, because imagine, imagine if say <laughs> Spanish troops, like say, imagine if Spanish troops were kind of rumbling around up more so up in here. This is, this would be more of a equivalent, not, not down here, but say Spanish troops were, a rumbling, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, um, to like the north of North Ireland. If Spanish troops were sort of rumbling up here, right up against uh, British North Ireland, which is sort of the, the, I guess, the equivalent of the analogy to, to, to the Sudeten land here, right? You got Spanish troops rumbling around up here. Okay, then what do the British do? They send a bunch of troops into North Ireland, right? where so, sort of where the spanish troops are rumbling around then you know i i forget the timeline but but it, like a few weeks later ireland agrees to become a protectorate of great britain would we would we be hopping mad would we be hopping up and down about whoever the prime minister at the Chamberlain or Churchill about their their unprovoked aggression and plan to invade Ireland and 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 you know their, their aggression against Ireland if that's what happened in Britain no no give me a break give me a break what I'm saying is there was no violation of the Munich agreement in fact, two days after the dissolution of Czechoslovakia, Chamberlain gave a speech to Parliament where he correctly stated that Hitler did not violate the agreement. Now, one thing about Chamberlain, and this is kind of why he was actually a dunce, but, he, but Chamberlain was actually a dunce, but not for the reasons most people think, is that apparently, like, apparently... Hitler told Chamberlain that once he had Sudeti, he, his territorial ambitions would be satisfied. If Hitler actually said that, which I believe Hitler did, um, that was a lie. But the, but the thing is, this was not why that was a lie. Uh, where is it? Yeah. The annexation of Chechia, not full annex, but quasi annexation of Chechia, that wasn't why it was a lie, right? Because this just fell into Hitler's lap, right? Hitler didn't have to do hardly anything to get this. Um, so this was this didn't violate the Munich Agreement. Ir so ironic, so and nor did it even violate Hitler's personal statement to Chamberlain that he had no more territorial ambitions. Now. Later, um, Hitler made outright territorial demands on on Danzig and Memel up here. Here it's showing that they already have it, but they didn't have it. Um, but yeah, they, uh, Hitler demanded Memel from Lithuania. Lithuania folded, and then they 
demanded Danzig, and as we know, Poland did not fold. So, so the fact that Hitler was lying about further territorial demands, um, that lie was shown by his demands on Memel and Danzig, not on Czechoslovakia. So Hitler was lying to Chamberlain in a personal communication, but not because of Czechia. But more importantly, here's what's more important than than, than that. Than the fact that that the uh, that the quasi annexation of Chechia did not violate either Chamberlain's personal trust or the Munich Agreement. It's that fuck Chamberlain's personal trust. That's just something Hitler said to you, okay? If Hitler said I have no further territorial ter territorial demands, which I believe Hitler said it because Hitler never denied it, okay? But the heck of it is, that wasn't part of any treaty, Chamberlain. That was just a personal communication between you and Hitler. Hitler, that, that, was, that was not a treaty. <laughs> Hitler never signed anything anywhere that said he had no further territorial ambitions. That's just a personal communique between you and him, okay? It, it, was, it, it wasn't part of a treaty. So, you know, if you want to say, well, it's not nice to lie. Okay, I agree. I mean, I'm generally against lying in most cases, as most people are. And most people are, are okay with a few white lies here and there. But, like, what, what the fuck are we talking about, right? So, what's amazing is that after this, what seems to have happened is that people now imagine that this personal communique between Hitler and Chamberlain was part of a treaty, and then over in Britain, th there's this public impression that Hitler violated the Munich Agreement or something because of Chechia, but that's not true at all. But uh, but even but they have this idea in their head that I will make no further territorial demands was actually something he signed when it wasn't, okay? So, it's ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. You're basically saying, oh, now we need to go to war because Hitler lied to Chamberlain in an off-the-record comment. Oh, got to bankrupt the empire. Oh, got to gotta have, you know, 40 million people killed. Oh, because Hitler lied to Chamberlain's face. Like, I mean, given the scale of what's coming... I, Holy moly. Um, so, so he, he violated Chamberlain's personal trust. So sad. So sad. Okay, but, he, but Hitler did not violate the actual Munich Treaty that he signed. Okay. Hitler lied to Chamberlain. Okay, so now we have to start, you know, Great War Part 2. I'm sorry Chamberlain was a dunce. But Hitler didn't break any treaties by quasi-annexing Chechia or by claiming Danzig or Memel, okay? When Chechia goes, well, it's not Chechia, when Hacha goes to Berlin and says, protect me, Hitler says, no, why don't you become a protectorate? And Hacha says, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not an invasion, that's not... That's, that's literally a piece of paper Hitler gave to Hacha. Hacha signed it. Done. That's, that's not an invasion. That's not a violation of the Munich Agreement. So this idea that Hitler's untrustworthy, why? Because he violated the Munich Agreement. He didn't. Hacha gave his country away. And, the, and there was no imminent invasion. There was no invasion threat. That's another myth. Hacha never said there was an invasion threat. German troop dispositions don't show that there was an invasion threat. So, no. Shut the fuck up. Okay. Um, okay, so I think it's now a good time to, to talk to the talk to the, the chat here. Um, what's chat doing? What's chat saying? Have been really We would be aggressive if you just didn't call the entire chat Controllers, kind of passive. I'm reading to the so so. If you want, oh, another, there's another three dollar uh, super chat. 
But now this is this is your moment, guys. This is your moment for uh, for an unpaid super chat. I actually read unpaid comment chat chat shit it up show feet show feet. You know, I ha I have like a whole gallery of feet if you want. I could put it in a zip file. I think there's some nudity in there. Well, to me, like barefoot is nudity. So whatever. Um, <laughs> Alt type won't ban me. Alt type barely reads the chat. If there if there's a mod here, they might ban you. But I I don't really ban much of the chat because the chat doesn't really chat's not really doing a whole lot of bannable offensive. Uh, Alt type thoughts on allies not declaring war in USSR after they invaded Poland. Um, well, what would you mean thoughts? Like, obviously, British foreign policy was, well, Britain was out to get Germany before the Munich Agreement, in my opinion. But, and the, and they were not out to get the Soviet Union. They're, they had a hard-on against Germany. What is your opinion on Franco? Um, he was a mediocre guy who did what he thought he had to do at the place and time that he did. Uh, Ryan, what do you think of Indian castes having more genetic distance than Germans and Greeks? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, what you're talking about, the, basically the idea of, of a country of India is, is a total fabrication. It's a total fabrication that came about, and it's largely Britain's fault. Um, it didn't have to be Britain's fault. If Britain had just held on to the Raj and didn't give them their independence, um, this wouldn't be a in, India wouldn't be the problem that it's starting to become to be. Um, but basically the idea of Indian of Indian identity, it's it's a function of the Raj existing as a singular political unit. But before the Raj, you know, if you look at like an ethnic map, or a genetic map of India. There's more genetic variation in India than there is in Europe. Basically, the idea of a unified Indian state is more absurd than the idea of a unified European state. Religiously, linguistically, and racially, it is more diverse than Europe. And Europe basically, and using the sort of colloquial definition of Europe bounded by the Straits of Gibraltar, the Mediterranean, the Dardanelles, somewhere in the Caucasus Mountains and the Urals and some line between the Urals and the Caspian Sea, right? We basically know what Europe means. That's that sort of been there. That there's, there's more linguistic, genetic and religious variation in India than there is in that area. So the idea of a, of a unified Indian state is, is absurd and India should not exist. And frankly, I think uh, certain uh, ra racial groups in India would be better off as independent states. Um, others would be worse off. <laughs> but, uh, um, how much is it the Jews and how much is it the Anglos? Well, the more I read about um, the British, especially on the diplomatic side during World War One and World War II, the more I really start to hate the, the eternal angle. Let me read the, 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 the paid chat. I need to read the paid chat. Anonymous for $3. I think the upper peninsula of Michigan would be a good place for white people. From a geographic standpoint, yes. However, the upper peninsula of Michigan is part of the state of Michigan. And if you want any kind of, of uh, control of those, those legacy sinecures of like state governors and senators and things, something like the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho is better. And 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 Utah. I mean, Utah's full of Mormons um, who are unfortunately less racially aware than they used to be, but they're still, got, they're, they're still a better bet than the typical white person uh, a Mormon is. But, uh, how will the Ukraine special operation end treaty-wise? Well, I mean, Putin already controls what, what he wants. Putin already Putin is already in possession of his war goals. So that war can end tomorrow if, if the West wants it. 
Right? The only reason the war is continuing to go on is because the West wants the war to keep going on. Um, Putin is totally in the right regarding Donetsk and Luhansk. The territory of Ukraine is is just the the administrative or the before the invasion was just the administrative boundary of the Ukraine SSR in the Soviet Union. It's not some these are not sacred lines. These are administrative boundaries never intended to be the borders of a sovereign state. The and so so there's no like and another thing, like people talk about treaties signed under duress, the Russian recognition of the borders of Ukraine in 1991 was a product of the reality that Russia was under duress internally, that Russia was not able to enforce the borders that they thought they had a right to, which was Crimea and the Donetsk and Luhansk. It wasn't until later that Russia you know, felt itself strong enough to try to begin taking back those territories that were unfairly assigned to the to this Ukraine state. Now, I also believe that the Russian state does eventually want to take over the rest of Ukraine. I don't think that's a practical thing uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, and I don't think it's on the very top of Putin's agenda, taking over the whole of Ukraine. Um, but basically, no, Russia's in the right regarding Donetsk and Luhansk and Crimea. Um, the war is going on because NATO wants it to go on. NATO doesn't give a shit about the Ukrainians. I think if, if NATO cared about the Ukrainians, what they would do is they would go to Ukraine and say, you're not getting this land back. The people there don't want to be part of Ukraine. They would rather be part of Russia. Shut the fuck up about all this propaganda about, oh, they, they're being forced into Russia. They don't really want to be part of we saw the same crap regarding Sudeti, or excuse me, regarding Austria, this lie that the Austrians didn't want to become part of Nazi Germany. Um, that, you know, and they're doing the same lies here with Donetsk and Luhansk. And of course, all the war propaganda about how 10 trillion Russians per day are being killed and Russians are being sent to the front without shoes and all this, this ridiculous crap. And it's like, and it's kind of weird, you know, I wonder. Like, what are people who are big, like, NATO believers thinking about this operation? What are they actually thinking? You know, are they thinking, like, like, because you, if you're being told, oh, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. It's like, okay. But I look at a map. Let's find a map. Um, map of Ukraine. You can find a map here. Um, so these are all dated. I mean, I don't, I mean, the lines have been pretty static, so I think you could take a map from basically whenever, and it's going to be fairly accurate. Um, so, oh, uh, maybe you guys want to see the map. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, like. Actually, no, this, this is too dated because, because, yeah, Mariupol, because I know the Russians took Mariupol. So, whatever. I forgot what I was, what I was even going to say, but basically Russia has taken all of this. But like, if you look at a map, pretend that the, that the lines show Russia taking all this, um, because that's what the more recent maps show. But if you see something like that and you're, and you're, and you're, and you're big time NATO bro, you're big time NATO believer. You know, you believe that that NATO has all the wonder weapons that that will defeat any enemy, because um, you're listening to U.S. because you're listening to Lockheed Martin propaganda. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Like, because you keep hearing all this stuff. We're winning. We're winning. We're winning. We're winning. But then here's the map. Like, okay, then why aren't you holding ground? And again, I talked about this previously. Like the stupidity of like, okay, so let's say let's say that the that Ukraine plus NATO volunteers, quote unquote, are are actually inflicting more casualties on the Russians than vice versa. And it's possible, as I've talked about previously, if you go to just the Wikipedia, the initial starting forces, there's no evidence that the Russians outnumbered the Ukrainian plus NATO coalition forces at the beginning. 
In fact, if anything, there was a slight numerical advantage to the opposition. But basically, numbers aren't a real big factor in this. At least there's at least there's no real evidence that they are or were. Okay, there's there's nothing to say. There's no reason to say that one side outnumbers the other. So if that's the case, um, and also one reason why one side probably doesn't outnumber the others because the armies are logistically bound, and so the amount of armies, the size of the armies that you can have in the field is more a function of roads than 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 anything. But um, but since that, but but basically, Russia's they're they're taking land. There's no reason to think that they significantly outnumber the the enemy, or they outnumber NATO and Ukraine, and they're taking land. So you think they're doing this despite taking greater casualties? They're taking land despite taking greater greater casualties, but not outnumbering the enemy. Like how does that work? It, it, that, 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 that's, that doesn't work. That's not that's not what happened in Finland back in back in 1939, 1940. Right? The Soviets did, by all accounts, take greater casualties, but they greatly outnumbered the Finns. And so they were able to take land despite taking greater casualties. But that doesn't appear, appear to be the case here. So I don't know. What what it what are NATO bros thinking? Like when they look at a map and see Russia taking land on the one hand, but on the other hand going, we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. <laughs> see, this is something that, that Goebbels would actually, like if, like, if, if Goebbels was running the NATO propaganda campaign, Goebbels would countenance against this. Goebbels was, was a little bit smarter in that he was, he didn't, he wasn't constantly beating the drum that of inevitable victory, right? Because Ger Goebbels was smarter than than whoever's in charge of NATO propaganda here, because because Goebbels wouldn't be saying like we're winning when they're not, because because what that does is that that results in a in a decline in trust in the propaganda arms, and and like depression and disillusion, and also a likelihood to reject any news of victory, going oh. We've heard that before. Yeah, we're winning, but we never win. You know, um, so yeah, it was kind of a kind of a debacle. It's this kind of a propaganda debacle on the on the part of NATO by saying we're winning, we're winning, we're winning. When I mean, I wouldn't say Russia is just BTFOing the the opposing coalition, but they're gaining ground. They're sort of getting the better of them on the whole. I mean. Yeah, Russian troops are getting captured. If you, there's probably really highly detailed observers who can find a few Russian units that got encircled and pocketed, and and vice versa, right? But on the whole, it seems that Russia is more winning than losing. Okay, so to the extent one side is is the winner, one side's the loser. But okay, wow, we're going on going on for a while here. Um, what are we doing? Holy moly! Show feet, you know. When are you making a hereditarianism comeback? Um. I I am, I am. Russia is taking it slow and steady. Russia does not want to occupy the whole of Ukraine because that could very easily trigger a full-on hot war with NATO, which Russia would lose. Make no mistake about that. I'm not. I'm not unrealistic in that regard and also and the thing is in, in a hot war between russia and say like the like a like a real hot war between russia and nato china is probably getting involved now now it's world war three so that is why i don't think putin is going to the thing and the thing is like this also sort of speaks to the duplicity of nato because at the very beginning you know, and I said this at the time when the Russians were doing that attack towards Kiev up from from Belarus through the, through the Pripyat marshes. I knew that that was not the main thrust. That was never going to be the main thrust. I think the Ukrainian generals knew as well that that was never going to be the main vector of attack. Simply because you couldn't supply an you can't supply an offensive through, the, through that. You can't supply the kind of offensive you need to take Kiev. Through the Pripyat marshes, um, it's never been done. And as it turns out, the, it, 
based on the Russian advance and then the Russian phase withdrawal from sort of the outskirts of Kiev, that's that that kind of shows to me that 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 drive was never meant to take Kiev. Okay. What that was meant to do is to draw Ukrainian forces to Kiev to force the Ukrainians to 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 commit some of their forces to Kiev and to have less forces at sort of the main area of fighting, which was around the south and the east from Crimea and, and Donetsk and Luhansk. So um, that is why. It, it, but but the thing is, you had all these uh, reporters, and and this was not count. This was not countenanced against by any um, U.S. or any other NATO countries' um, military staff that, oh, Ukraine is in danger, Putin is trying to take Kiev. And the evidence of that they used was the advance towards Kiev, which is like, which they knew, like they know, they knew that that was a lie. They knew that the advance towards Kiev was never meant to take Kiev. They knew this. I fucking knew it. Okay, so they knew that was a lie. Why are they saying it? They said it because they're trying to galvanize the... They're, they're trying to keep up the lie to the Ukrainian people that they're in a war of national survival, which they're not. They're not. They're in a war for, for that... for that Kike Zelensky to continue to rule, to continue to lord over the Donetsk and Luhansk. That's, that's it. That's what this war is about. That Zelensky can continue to rule over Donetsk and Luhansk when those people don't want anything to do with, with one of the most corrupt states on the planet. More corrupt than Russia. Russia would be an improvement to Ukraine. That's all they're fighting for. They're not fighting for national survival. They're not fighting for the betterment of Ukraine. The longer the war this goes on, the worse it is for Ukraine. They're not, they're not fighting for Ukraine. They're fighting for Zelensky, and they're fighting for the Donetsk and Luhansk, and they're fighting to, to be to, to act as like a, a, a thorn in Putin's eye. That that's all, it, and it's such a it's such a sham, and it's so typical NATO. This kind of behavior had been going on since the, since the Crimean War. This crap. The, the, these. And the thing is, this is another example of where if NATO weren't involved, this war would be over. And you want to see an example of that? Crimea. NATO didn't get involved. Putin just landed in Crimea, took it, done, over. There was not some long war. There didn't need to be some long war. Same thing with Donetsk and Luhansk. There'd be a short and sharp war because the Ukrainians weren't just going to give it away. But okay, push them out, done. War's over. The war could be over now, the war is over if you want it right now. So, well, certainly since the Crimean War, the NATO has been this way. And by NATO, I'm referring to the British Empire, come U.S. Empire, come NATO proper. Right? And they have always been this way. And I fucking hate them. All right. Um, Poland. Poland. Um something about Poland. Uh, so March 31st, Britain and France, they give Poland an unconditional uh, war guarantee. Order of events, remember March 14th was when Hacha goes, I think it was, I forget if it was March 14th or March 15th when the, when the protector was set up, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Czechoslovakia was done basically March 4th. So, Protector of Bohemia and Moravia. Now, one thing that's interesting about the Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, they were actually conducting independent trade treaties for Bohemia and Moravia with at least, uh, I know with Sweden and at least one other country. Um, so, Bohemia and Moravia was to some extent conducting its own foreign policy somewhat. So the end, so the 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 sovereignty of Chechia was not completely extinguished by the protectorate, at least not until the war started. When yeah, it, it's, but but before the but in the six month interlude between the establishment of the protectorate and World War II, Bohemia did have legitimate bona fide um, independence to some degree. They were not 
entirely a Nazi vassal. They they did become one later, though, thanks to the war. But um, on March 31st, uh, Britain and France, they give Poland an unconditional war guarantee. They also give one to Yugoslavia and Romania, but nobody cares because Hitler was never going that way. But... Uh, so the, the one, the only one that matters that anyone cares about is Poland. Okay. Um, so they are treaty bound to go to war with any country that attacks Poland, be it Germany or the USSR. Now, of course, we know USSR attacks Poland. Okay, declare war on the USSR. Uh, nope. So, so obvious. So, uh, so, so that's not true. Obviously, it, this was this was about you know we need to go to war with Germany. Okay. So they give Poland. The unconditional war guarantee. A little talk about the situation of the German minority in Poland. Remember, Poland exists because of Germany. I say this, and I get some what I think is a really strange resistance to this fact that Poland at this time exists because of Germany. It's weird. It's a weird resistance people have. It's, I, I think it mainly comes from Poles who want to say, no, we got our own resistance from our own sweat, blood, and tears. We did it ourselves. And like, and, th and let me put it this way. Most countries that exist did not gain their independence from their own blood, sweat, and tears, period. No state in Africa got their independence from their own blood. If Britain, and Fr if Britain was truly committed to maintaining control of India, India would not be independent to this day. Britain had the real, no, despite how much debt she was in, it, Britain had, if, if they were fully committed to maintaining control of India, Britain had the material resources to maintain control of India indefinitely. Okay. Same with the Soviet Union, actually. I mean, if, if the leadership of the Soviet Union wanted to keep the show going, they could have kept it going, right? It, it just depends on how how willing they were to have co to deal with constant insurrections co and constant decline in standard living, increased military spending, and a deteriorating economy. But but it was but the thing is, it wasn't materially impossible to maintain the Soviet Union or the British Empire. It just wasn't quote unquote feasible to those people at the time. Um, anyway, regarding Poland, so here's 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 Europe in 1914. Where's Poland? Oh, here's Poland. Now I, you can look at a map of how far Germany advanced into Russia in World War One. They advanced sort of like here. This is about how far they go. I think some advanced units went across the Dnieper, but basically, the uh, the 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 Panther Wotan line. As as in World War II, this was called the Germans called this the Panther Wotan line. It's sort of a natural line following the Dnieper, then it goes up into the Pripets, and then there's the Davina, and it sort of goes up to Riga. But there's also sort of a natural schmutzy area here, and then Lake Pipus, and then sort of the Narva area up here. So there's sort of a natural defensive line here. And this has always sort of been what kind of separated Russia from, from the rest of Europe was this line. Um, I think there's other names for it, but the only but the only name that I know that someone gave this line was the Germans in World War II, and they called it the Panther Rotan line. So I don't know what else to call it. But um, but yeah, that was basically the area of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, and then the Germans, I think, kind of egregiously claimed a little bit more, plus they claimed the Crimea, and tried to set up some quasi-independent states down in the Caucasus. Um, so, Poland. I mean, Poland tried to have their independence in the 18... after the Crimean War, just before the Crimean War. Um, that obviously didn't work. When did Poland get their independence? When the Russian army was destroyed and the Kingdom of Poland was set up by Germany. And then at the Treaty of Versailles, Poland was handed a bunch of territory from the Habsburgs, and they were handed a bunch of territory from the German Empire. Okay? Whatever your opinion of, on that, you know, I don't... I think the territory that, that the Polish state was handed, on the whole, with a few exceptions, on the whole, 
was more Polish than German, that they were handed at Versailles. I think on the whole, the territorial concessions to the Polish state were justified. Not all of it. The Gdynia area, I believe, wasn't totally justified. There is some justification that Poland needs a port. Okay, you could work something out there. But there are some areas that was handed to Poland, particularly in like this area of Silesia and further into Posen, that were, in my opinion, egregious that Poland should not have been handed, which increased the size of the German minority in Poland, which created problems. So, but no, Poland exists because of Germany. And then they grab some German, they grab territory from Germany after the war the very state, Germany and Austria-Hungary, they grab some territory from these states after the war, the very states that they owe their independence to. Think of that however you will, okay? Should Poland not have done that? I don't know, but I will say it's... it's you could see how that could be a source of friction, a source of bad blood, right? We gave you your independence... You would not be independent if not for us. And now you're grabbing land at our expense at Versailles. So just, I'm not saying you should side with the Germans or the Habsburgs against Poland. Just saying, it could be a cup of trembling in the future. That said, Hitler kind of went out of his way to sort of not make it a cup of trembling. Um, so, what were the beefs between Germany and Poland between 38 and 39? Well, it was not the restoration of... Hitler was not demanding a full restoration of pre-war borders. He did not, right? Hitler would have been demanding basically all of this and actually more of this, like going down sort of to here along this river than down here... Like Hitler would have been demanding a lot more if he was demanding the restoration of the pre-war borders. He was not. That said, Hitler had... Even that would not be completely without any merit altogether because Hitler could say, look, this territory ceded to Poland at Versailles. This was a treaty signed under duress. Not valid. We're taking it back. That's not a completely meritless argument. But... That's kind of theoretical. But what I'm saying is even if Hitler did demand all that, you know, whatever your personal opinion of that is, I think it's, I think that would be too, I think that would be unwise on Hitler's part. It, that, even, even that, which Hitler never did, even that wouldn't be entirely without merit. That's what I'm saying. Um, but what were the beefs that Hitler held on to? He didn't, he didn't hold on to demanding all this territory, but he did hold on to some. So what were they? Well, the first... was the perception regarding the German minority. I don't want to speak too strongly of the reality of that, but there was certainly a perception that the German minority was put upon by the Poles. Most of the sources for this were in German, um, certainly all the press sources were in German, which I don't have, but there are press reports all over the place about all sorts of, um, not nice things Poles were doing to the German minority. Um, as for the German press sources, I don't consider them to be particularly untrustworthy, but, the, but then again, I don't view the Nazi regime to be particularly untrustworthy. I don't view the German, the, the press under Nazi Germany as any less trustworthy as, say, the American press today or the British press or, you know, so I don't, I don't immediately write them off any more than I would write off the British press. But from an argumentative standpoint, most people would because they said, well, it's not Germany, it's Goebbels. They literally had a propaganda minister. We don't have a propaganda minister. We have public information. We have, we have public relations, not propaganda. <laughs> so, um, So, uh, and, and basically, and a problem regarding the, the atrocities, the atrocity stories, is that there's basically only two presses that are covering it. The Polish press and the German press. 
The Polish press tends to deny these atrocities. The German press affirms these atrocities. Wow. Okay, so basically we don't know if any of this is real. Um, now, I can't bring this up on uh, Wikipedia. This is Bloody Sunday. I I haven't... When I'm bringing up Wikipedia, this is basically... Oh, I got a big I got a big donation. Oh, I, I will read that. I read all donations, by the way. They're not they're not showing up here. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why they're not popping on screen with the with the with the obnoxious, you know, robo voice. Um, but but I am reading donations. Don't you worry. Um, now when I'm reading from Wikipedia, this is basically my admission that I haven't done a proper dive onto this. This is basically my apology. I'm citing Wikipedia. I really don't like to cite Wikipedia. Um, if I have anything better, but. I don't, so sorry. Anyway, um, after German Shebel should cite flop something, uh, Polish Institute of National Resistance found 254 Lutheran victims assumed to be German civilians and 86 Catholic victims assumed to be Polish civilians, as well as 20 Polish soldiers, approximately, blah, 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 after the fall of the city. Okay, so there we go. 254 German civilians killed at... Bromberg in September of 1939. This is, of course, during the war. But okay, so we know that there was a massacre of Germans by the Poles at least once the war started. Okay? So there's something. And this is and this is basically, as far as I'm concerned, this is as confirmed as... This is literally on Wikipedia. When Wikipedia is admitting to a Polish atrocity against a German minority, that's basically... It's basically true. That that's about as true as you can get for something like that. Because obviously Wikipedia's bias is anti-Nazi. And so anything anything that says the Nazis had a point, if it comes from Wikipedia, I just accept it as true. So so we know this so we know at least this happened. Um that's another thing I have. Okay, here we go. Fortunately, this is in Neanderthal, so, um, god damn it. Brave doesn't have the, the convert. Okay, I'll, I'll open this in Chrome so we can, so we can have this said in something that is not a, a, uh, an archaic dialect of English. Um. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'll try to zoom in. I mean, I can see it, but I don't. I don't know what it's showing up on the stream. So, uh... all right. Uh, blah 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 blah. Report from the State Office Building, Elbing, about 10 p.m. Stable bird down. Property owner fire. Reinhard Brees, West Prussia, located on German Polish border. An incendiary bomb of Polish origin was seen in the fire. Property widow Martha Zerkowski in Schwein, West Prussia, located in German-Polish border due to arson. Poland. Perpetrator set fire. Uh, and again, you know, I look at these and, like, could it have been Polish arsonists? Maybe. But arson is like a... Hate crime hoaxes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, uh... Arson is great for a hate crime hoax because it burns down everything. It burns down all the evidence. So whenever I see arson and it's and it's related to a supposed hate crime, which is basically, I mean, they don't use the word hate crime at this time in history, but that's basically what they're they're doing. They're accusing poles of hate crimes. Um, uh, grain of salt, arson, who knows? The point of all this and all these little um oh Elbing police station is a pretty busy busy place. Um Elbing police station office of Elbing Elbing <laughs> So receive seven to eight rifle shots from the Polish side. <laughs> what so whenever the, the point of all this is not to say I am 100% certain that all this was true. I don't know. I wish this is true. 
is maybe it maybe it's all true maybe none of it's true the point i'm making is that the germans certainly thought it was true and certainly some of it was true and the reason i say with certainty there is at least some truth there is at the bare minimum there's at least one drop of truth to this idea of Polish atrocity on Germans is here. So, now this is, of course, after the invasion. Do we believe that none of this was going on before the invasion? I don't think so. There was another investigation. This is um, the Polish atrocities against the German minority in Poland, edited by the Foreign Office. This is German. This is a Nazi publication. So I look at this, and so, like, look, I, I take this with a grain of salt because it's a government publication and it's pushing a narrative that the government supports. That's why I take this with a grain of salt. Not because it's a Nazi publication or the Nazi bureaucracy is going to be particularly dishonest. Just because it's a government publication saying more than 58,000 dead or missing. Why are you... Okay. Um, that's why. Um. Ah! <laughs> Who made it? Look at this. This is a this is a Hitler speech, and it's kind of an important speech historically. But like, look at this. Look at this dude. What are you doing? Stop. Uh, here's another one of these. This is um a uh what I call a colored text page. So, unfortunately, the problem with colored text pages is that as soon as you send them to somebody, say, uh, German, uh, Polish atrocity against the Germans, and then you send them something like this, they immediately, alarm bells go off because look, colored text, all caps letters. So, don't, don't make colored text pages. I mean, I'm not going to discount what you're saying just because it's a colored text page, but a lot of people will. A lot of people are very superficial thinkers and will go, look, colored text, exclamations, you know. Keep your hands on your weapons, white man. Like, I mean... The moral of the story, keep your, keep your hands on your weapons, white man. I mean, I agree. Like, I don't disagree with this. But this looks like, you know. You know. You know. You know what this looks like. Um, there is something that was a little bit better. Where was it? Not here. Here's another color text page. But they have references to things. So you can go to the references and confirm what's on the uh, the, the color text page. Um, where was it? Not here. Do I not have it? Was I an idiot? Was I an idiot? I was an idiot. I don't have it. God damn it. I'm a moron. I'm sorry, guys. There's an important... Uh, Important thing, David Hogan, the forced... Holy shit, somebody broke the bar. Okay, I need to talk to the Super Chats because I'm rambling right now trying to re retake my place because I still have a ton of stuff to go into regarding Poland. Uh, but I am reading the... Uh, the I'm going to read the, uh, the the White Power Chats here. So hold on a sec. Um, holy moly. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So in order, ten dollars, Jimmy Two Hats. That's the message. It just says Jimmy Two Hats. Thank you. Fifteen dollars from Nitro. Do you think there's any hope for her hereditary thought going mainstream? Um. Okay. How best to combat people like Luantin that use complicated population genetics to obscure facts about race? Basically, what I'm saying. First off, the Argumentation needs to be reformed. Argumentation needs to be, be reformed. Um, 
Because the thing is, you're not going to be able to out. And I, and I brought this up. I made videos about this, about about the reform that that we need to do. Um, and the video I brought up, I brought up about Iraq and WMDs. And the importance of that, the lesson of that, is that you're not going to be able to out minutiae grind the authorities. Like, did did we learn that Iraq didn't actually have WMDs, or at least not many? Now, there are some people who are going to counter with, well, there's evidence that they were sent off over to Syria. Maybe I'll deal with that in a second. But but the way it was shown that Iraq doesn't didn't have at least not a threatening or substantial amount of WMDs, not ones that would that would warrant the hysteria that they were talking about. Which frankly, I don't think I don't think they needed Iraq need to be justified in having nukes at all. Because that's the only way you you can deal with NATO, these psychos who don't talk and only fight. Um, but anyway, that said, um, we learned that Iraq Moving away from the premise that Iraq shouldn't have nukes, which I don't agree with, and I and I also don't agree that a dictator is un, is more unstable than a democracy. That's a fucking lie. But uh, even so, even granting all all the all the all the presuppositions, we found out that Iraq didn't have WMDs by the fact. That we literally had to blow the country to smithereens. We, quote unquote. I mean, it's not it's not my army, not my country, but they had to literally blow the country to smithereens, end up being indirectly responsible for something like a million deaths. You know, that's what it took to find out that they weren't actually there. It wasn't done through argumentation. It wasn't done through, like, right, well, let me go through this document. Or, wait a minute, this statement here doesn't line up what he said here. Or, 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 you know. And the thing is, there was no shortage of witnesses. There was no shortage of authoritative witnesses. There was no shortage of uh, Saddam defectors saying, oh, yeah, there's, you know, and what they were talking about. It, I don't know if you remember those Colin Powell <laughs> those presentations where he's going like, yeah, um, the reason we can't find any of these weapons labs, these weapons factories, is because they're mobile. He has mobile weapons factories on trucks. <laughs> he's having these factories. They're just trundling around on trucks, producing sarin, <laughs> like a semi bed and stuff. It's like, I just imagine like this truck just sort of bumping around, bumbling around. Oh, 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 God, oh, put the sarin in here. Oh, you know, you hit a bump and the, and the, <laughs> and the flask shatters or something. I mean, it's just, it's just goofy. I know I'm, I'm taking the piss out of it. Obviously, they would come to a stop before they did anything. I understand what the theory is. They would come to us. The idea is this never happened, but the idea is they would come to a stop and then take all the stuff out and start making the chemicals. Then they would like properly secure them and then they would move to a new location. I know. I know. I'm just taking the piss out of that idea a little bit, but, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway. Oh shit. But yeah, that, that's that's how it has to be done. It has to be done through... Okay, Nitro. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to... I'm going to respond to Nitro's next comment again. Um, Nitro. Um, I say this, and I'm on Cozy, which is an America first place, which means uh, Christianity a lot, partic in particular Catholicism, but... but lots of bible believers on this site so but i have i have to say what i have to say to make the arguments that i think need to be made to to the atheists let me ask you to the atheists did you stop believing in the bible because of some great atheist argument against this or that line of scripture was it some great comprehensive deconstruction of of biblical claims no no, it didn't happen at all. It didn't happen that way at all. For for most people, certainly not. That's not how it happened for me. So, and the thing is, like, communism, right? In the Soviet Union, 
people believe in communism. Russia today, communism is becoming less and less popular. It's more so the older generation that believes it. The conservatives, the conservative communists, the conservative Stalinists who, who are fans of communism. Younger generations in Russia, not so much fans. So how did that happen? Was there some great refutation? Like, no, there's not a great refutation. Can't So the thing is, can anything be done at the level of argument at all? And I'm a little bit pessimistic, but I'm not totally pessimistic. Because the way the way you need to argue is not get is to not go down myusha grinding basically and i talked about this before the way you need to argue is you need to is you need to and this is what i'm talking about before that my disillusion with ticky tack opposition to the narrative because when you have ticky tack opposition to the narrative you cannot properly and truthfully castigate the narrative as a religion right for me like what i'm saying here about about kind of kind of you know doing a debunking of this myth of nazi aggression this is part of the same thing as biological differences between races this is the same it, it's part of the same beast it's the same narrative it's one thing they're not separate okay and my problem, or I think the problem that I guess, quote unquote, we have had in argumentation is that we have kept, is, is that we have allowed these topics to be separate. And we shouldn't allow them be, to be separate because they all came about at, so, at roughly the same sort of time period. It's sort of the same people who push them, right? The kinds of people who are the most like anti-Nazi, I'm anti-fascist. Are the same people who support um infanticide castration you know and the mixing of races so it, it's all the same it, it's the same religion and the thing is this this notion of of uh, informal religions religions that don't have a central text this has always been the case you know people people refer to americanism like sort of the 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 zeitgeist of cultural norms of 1950s United States, they recognize that as a thing. So the thing is, what we need to do is we need to recognize the whole narrative that we're opposing as a singular religion, and that this singular religion is false. That's what that's the thing, right? And that and that's how atheism beat out. It it, it hasn't completely beat out Christianity yet. Um, but I believe it will become a major majority at some point, but then eventually become a minority. Atheists will eventually become a minority or worldwide. Um, well, it's, I mean, they are a minority worldwide, uh, but, I believe, but I believe atheists will become a majority in the United States and will stay a majority for some period, but eventually will stop being a majority. But I don't, I don't want to go into that. The way you defeat this narrative is basically the way you defeat the, how can how can you fight against a set of ideas if you won't even call it a set of ideas how do you refute a religion if you won't even call it a religion it would be like trying to say like scientology like if instead of attacking scientology comprehensively you said oh i'm going to try to convince you just of one thing not one thing at a time. I understand that. I understand trying to convince people one thing at a time. You I mean, you have to. But but just just saying, well, I'm just going to convince you that the e-meter is bullshit. Nothing else. They, you know, you're fine to believe in in Thetans possessing your spirit. You're you're fine to believe in Targetu and Xenu and all that. Okay. But the e-meter is bullshit. What if that's all you did? What's that going to do? Is that going to cause the person to stop being a Scientologist? It, you know, given that your goal is to get someone to stop being a Scientologist in the same way our goal is to stop, get people to stop believing in the hegemonic cult at this place and time, you have to identify it as a hegemonic cult. Okay, anyway, also the TLO group plus docs are no longer able to be accessed. If you had any updates on that whole project, please share. Always here to support you and all of your work. 
Thank you. And I, okay. And thank you for that donation. And thank you for that notification. Because that needs, because I... I can access it. I'm going to have to look into this and I'm going to have to see after the stream um, what people can do if they can access it and stuff. Because I, I can access it right now, but I'm not, I don't, so I don't know what's going on. Anyway, um, I screwed up. I really, I really needed to have um, Hogan's stuff. David Leslie Hogan's uh, The Forced War. Um, most of the stuff in David Leslie Hogan's book is an example of the problem that I've been talking about, which is minutiae grinding. Um, and I'm not saying that what David Le Leslie Hogan is saying is false. I, I, as, you know, given that he's a heterodox researcher, he's obviously more committed to what he's saying than he is to professional or financial advancement because he's basically saying it, it, you know the war didn't have to happen and, and Hitler wasn't the aggressor um so I'm more likely to believe that than I am somebody who's supporting the narrative because if you're supporting the, the narrative there's obviously a conflict of interest right now there is a conflict of interest with David Hogan right he's losing money and prestige by saying the war wasn't necessary right by basically defending Hitler quote unquote so so for him, there is a conflict of interest, but the fact that he wrote a book such as The Forced War is evidence that he overcame that conflict of interest. Okay? So that's why I trust heterodox basically anything more than I trust orthodox. Because they have shown themselves to overcome the conflict of interest. Um, even if what... The, that's not to say necessarily that what they're saying is true. They can, you know... You could believe something, write it, be committed to it, and be wrong. I'm just saying that it's that at least you know he's not deliberately lying. You can be pretty certain of that. That that the Holocaust revisionists are not deliberately lying. You know, um, the reason I but the reason I wanted to get David Leslie Hogan's book is because he had a passage talking about land reform. Um, and there was a quote there, um, and it was something like eight to one, the land reform favored, uh, Poles over Germans. Uh, the Polish government was for every, for every, um, acre of land that Poles lost, um, Germans lost eight. So, so, so that's some sort of objective evidence of that the Germans were being treated unfairly. I'm not, you know. We shouldn't necessarily say, oh, though well, that's all it was, because that's all we can find. No, no, that's just all you can find. That's all that's all you know. Um, in terms of massacres, well, this that the German Nazi special in investigation after the war in Poland said fifty-eight thousand people dead or missing, or excuse me, fifty-eight thousand Germans uh dead or missing in Poland. So are the Germans exaggerating? Probably. Probably. Um, are they completely lying? Well, we know they're not completely lying. But the point of that... Okay, I'm able to access the group now. Okay, thank, thank you, Nitro Bean. And you got a cameo on the stream. But given that you shelled out as many buckaroos as you did, 75 and 15, get all the cameos you want. <laughs> um... What was I saying? So, uh, but the point really of a German minority is that it was perceived to be a big deal in Germany and, and it perceived to be a big deal to Hitler. It was one of the demands of Hitler, which was some, some modicum of legal protections of the German minority in Poland. So that was one. That was the first thing. Um, okay, so just, Hitler's core demands... The thing is, he sent multiple. There are there are multiple things. The negotiations with Poland had been going on since 1934. Okay, so so there's lots of lots of propositions. But basically, there are three core demands that Hitler kept, and Hitler and his ambassadors kept kept giving out. 
Uh, one was that Danzig be returned to Germany. Um, that this is less odious than you think. First off, on this map, they're showing Danzig to be huge. That's not true. And they're also showing it to be like way over here. That's not true either. It was actually contiguous with the East Prussian border. So it was not, this, this map is, this is actually kind of a bad map. <laughs> actually, this is actually not a very good map. Uh, whoops. But yeah, it's actually like a lot smaller. Anyway, um, and also by the time, by 1934, I think by 1935, the port of Gdynia had bypassed Danzig in terms of the amount of trade that was going through. Um, so Danzig was not, Danzig was losing its economic importance to Poland every day. Um, the second thing that Hitler wanted was an international corridor connecting Germany to East Prussia. So there's that. Uh, and the legal protections of Germans in Poland. So those were sort of those were the three core demands that were in every proposal. Sometimes the Hitler or his ambassador would include a plebiscite of sort of this area. That this area, that the people in this area should be allowed to vote on whether they wanted to be part of Poland or Germany. So sort of the, the Gdynia area. Um, I, I'm sure the proposals varied in terms of what exactly constituted this area, but it's basically this area. It's basically like this, right? This area here. Um, and some proposals included the plebiscite, some did not. So the plebiscite of, of the Gdynia area was sort of an off and on thing. Now, given that the plebiscite for the Gdynia area was wasn't in all of the proposals, it's only in some of them, I guess half. I believe Hitler would have been satisfied if the Poles merely agreed to the first three of these things. They agreed to Danzig, Corridor, and some legal protections of the Germans in Poland. If Poland agreed to those three things, I believe Hitler would be satisfied. And that the and that he would say no to the plebiscite. He, he, remember, Hitler was already writing off all of this land, right? Compare this to like to, to this. Right. Hitler was already willing to write off most of the land that Germany, that Poland took from Germany at Versailles. Okay, so the idea that he would further write off Gdynia is not unbelievable. Um, but why, why do people today, like they, this thin end of the wedge argument? That at the beginning I was talking about, you know, appe appeasement and the wild universal success of appeasement how wonderfully successful appeasement and how it's almost never the thin end of any wedge now look i can understand i can understand this like i can see a kind of superficial plausibility for a thin end of the wedge argument um regarding the Sudeti. As already explained, that's not, that was, that was never reality. It didn't actually happen that way, but I can see it. I can see why you would say it, you know, cause you, I mean, the country's basically before the war even starts, they're already encircled, right? So I can understand this. I can see your point. It's not true, but I can see it. I don't see shit with this. Okay, I don't see anything regarding this. First off, the material gains of the Danzig Corridor to Germany at the expense of Poland, that's that's nothing. All right, that that's that's nothing in terms of 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 Polish combat power cuz first off that area is 95% German. I forget how many were there. I think it's less than 100,000 Germans anyway. It's not going to significant it's not going to it's not going to give the Germans significantly more bodies. It's not, it's not even going to give them a single division, right? Out of a population of a hundred thousand, you're not even going to be able to get a division out of that. So, so no, it's, it, it doesn't. So on a material sense, no. Okay. Does it create more angle? So, the, so Hitler's demands are not materially odious to the war making capabilities of Poland. 
Okay, Danzig is not materially odious. The corridor is not materially odious. Neither of these reduce Poland's combat power at all. Okay, um, but maybe it's a geographic thing. Maybe by having Danzig, they can more easily invade, or maybe by using the international corridor, they can sneak some troops in through the international corridor, and then surprise, and then burst out from the corridor. Like there's think of it, there's like a line here, and then there's like a column of troops, and surprise, they burst out from that from that corridor or something. Okay, um, I I can see it. I can see that problem in the original timeline in the real world. The Poles lost Danzig in the first day of fighting, and they were very quickly swept out of this whole area. This whole area was not critical in one bit to Pol to Poland's defense at all. This 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 had nothing to do with Poland's defense, right? Um, they're very quickly swept swept out of of uh, Posen and Gdynia, and their main defense sort of occurred around here, sort of around this little ball here, um, and this area around sort of the Lublin area, um, which wouldn't have mattered once the Soviets got here. But this is basically sort of the core defensive ball of Poland, sort of bounded by these rivers and and here. Th this was sort of, the, this was where Poland was, it was ever going to be able to make a stand. And that's what Manstein said before the invasion even started, that the Poles were idiots by deploying troops so far forward. They're just gonna get encircled. They'd be better off if they just pulled back into this little ball down in here. So in terms of Poland's defensive capabilities vis-a-vis -vis Germany, None of, the, none of this matters, right? None of this matters in, from a geographic standpoint in terms of defensibility. It's not like not like the Golan Heights supposedly are. Okay, so none of this matters from a geographic standpoint. Okay, so it doesn't matter from a geographic standpoint. Does it matter from, mater from a war material standpoint? Almost certainly, because this is outer Silesia. This is some of the best industrial land in the world. But Hitler wasn't demanding that outright anyway. So in terms of an invasion... Poland was going to continue to control all of this, all of this area, up to the day of the invasion. So whatever. So, so from a war making standpoint, Poland gets from a war material standpoint, from an industrial standpoint, pre-war to build up the army before the war, they're going to be able to keep it. From a geographic standpoint, Danzig and the corridor are are irrelevant because this whole area is irrelevant. Right. So basically I'm saying the idea that Danzig and the corridor were important because of its because it's a thin end of the wedge of a later conquest of Poland is horseshit. Um I mean no military strategist at the time said that the corridor significantly weakened Poland's defensive capabilities. Um and and we know that the whole region was irrelevant to Poland's defensive prospects. Even if the Poles were too proud to admit it, the reality was none of this matters to the war. All that's going to matter regarding the war was how long Poland could hold out in this area. That's that's all that was going to matter. Okay, um, the Polish generals didn't. The, the Polish generals were too proud because the Polish leadership from top to bottom were were retards. They were they were so stupid, and they so overestimated themselves. And I think they overestimated themselves because they had fa some fanciful notions about the Russo-Soviet War in the 1920s. They were able to defeat. Well, they, they weren't even, and they didn't really even defeat them. But whatever. I could talk about the Russo, uh, the the uh, Soviet-Polish War. Um. So. There are two reasons why Hitler's Hitler probably didn't have an invasion of Poland as part of his master plan. Um, well, three reasons. First is that the demands on Poland did not did not weaken Poland's defensive prospects against a German invasion. They did not. Here's the second thing, and this is actually kind of what um, what convinced me to start this particular presentation. This was sort of like. Because I'd all, I'd, I'd, things had already been percolating in my mind, but this was basically it. This was this was basically when I what more or less convinced me, and then convinced me to start looking deeper, and then basically confirm. Immediately prior to the invasion of Poland, so this is this is getting this is after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but that was August twentieth. Um, Immediately prior to the invasion, which was, as we know, September 1st, 
Hitler delayed the invasion of Poland several times in response to Polish diplomatic envoys stating that they wanted to reopen talks. The invasion was supposed to commence on August 26th. Hitler had delayed it in response to Polish envoys until, as we know, September 1st. He was delaying the invasion against the advice of his generals, because the generals were saying, the longer we wait, the more the Polish sort of get wind of our troop dispositions, where they are. And if they know where our troops are, they sort of have an idea of what our plan of invasion is. The longer we wait, the, the better the Poles will be able to adjust for, for, for the coming invasion. Because at this point, the Poles had already mobilized. In fact, the Poles had, had begun general mobilization before the Germans did. So the Poles were not surprised. That's if Anyone who says the Poles, it was a surprise invasion of Poland. The Poles were not surprised in the slightest. Um, neither were the Soviets at Barbarossa, but that's another, that's a whole nother myth to, 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 to go over. Um, but, um, so that's that. So Hitler's delaying the invasion several times. So that's kind of curious. He's de delaying the invasion against the advice of his generals in response to Polish envoys to say, hey, we're willing to negotiate. That kind of calls into question the idea that Hitler was dead set on invading Poland. And remember, he was delaying the invasion even after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So this idea that the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was a fait accompli against Poland, that doesn't seem to be true. That, Pol that I don't think Poland was doomed even after August 20th. And August 20th, the Molotov would have dropped, right? that's when Orthodox historians say Poland's doomed. I don't think that's true at all. I think Poland, if, they, if Poland had just stopped following Britain's lead and had just talked, just fucking talked, you know, just said, you know what? You know, maybe, maybe we'll start, maybe we'll stop using, um, maybe we'll stop tying up uh, Germans on trees and using them as pinatas. And then maybe we'll, we'll just stay out of Danzig and let you uh, drive from, from Pomerania to East Prussia. You know, maybe that would be better. Maybe we'll just do that. And, and maybe, we'll, maybe we'll count our lucky stars that you're letting us have all, basically all of the territory that we took from you at Versailles. You know, maybe we'll stop being these, these in, incorrigible parochial assholes. <laughs> right? Like Poland was, Poland were the assholes. Now, or at least the Polish government were. I'm not sure how much the, the Polish general public was on board with with this. Um, especially once the bombs dropped, I'm pretty sure the Polish public realized that, they're, that they were led by a bunch of idiots. Um, April 1939, very critical month. Well, March 31st, that was when Britain issued the war guarantee to Poland. The, the blank check, as it's referred to. Um, I don't remember the dates, but I remember the month. Two things happened in April that are very important. The Poles ended formal peace talks. That was one. Individual envoys would keep being sent between capitals and diplomatic offices, but but the the talks, right, where the guys are sitting in a room for an extended period of time. That was over. That ended in April of 1939. Um, in April of 1939, in, in that same month, that was when Hitler did, did something else. This is, and this may surprise you. Hitler lifted the ban in Germany on German newspapers covering stuff regarding the German minority in Poland. When I read that, that, that fucking floored me. I don't, I, I'm not able to find when this ban was issued, but the fact that such a ban was ever in place, ever, Hitler saying to German newspapers, don't report on, on the situation of the German minority in Poland. I mean, that, like, 
when I when I read that, that was that that was when I that that fact basically convinced me that Hitler did not have designs on Poland, right? I mean, even what he's what what he's demanding of Poland is is so slight, and that, and delaying the invasion several times. So, um, yeah. Um, that, that was a, a kind of a, a, a revelation for me. So really, um, about okay, let's just talk about the Glywitz raid here, people talk about. Um, so okay, so the Glywitz incident, the Western press uh, says it was a hoax, says that it was a false flag, that was basically a bunch of SS guys dressed up in, in Polish uniforms that raided some radio station or whatever. I don't know. But I do know that the Germans had made accusations about those kinds of things against the Poles since, well, since the ban was lifted, since April of 1939. Um, so this thing at Gleiwitz, this is not for, I mean, like here's just some, where was it? I mean, this is just stuff from like the immediate run up. It's a Neanderthal. Uh, but yeah, you saw it. Like they're, they're reporting these kinds of things all the time. So... Whatever. Um, here's the problem. The Glywitz raid occurred, whether it was real or false flag, it occurred on August 31st. So the German invasion plan was slated for August 26th, if not for Hitler's incessant delays. So whether it was an SS hoax or a Polish raid, that's irrelevant because the invasion was slated to begin five days before anyway. So this narrative that the Nazis used the Glywitz incident as a pretext for invasion, there's no way it's, that's, that's not true, right? Because they would have invaded without it if Hitler hadn't kept delaying, because they were going to delay on August 26, five days before the Glywitz incident, Hitler kept delaying the invasion. Glywitz incident, whatever it was, happened on August 31st, and the invasion happened a day later. And so, and, and so that's the Western press being retarded and not knowing what's happening. Right. That's the Western press saying maybe it was a false flag. I don't know. I'm guessing it wasn't. But if it was, it, who cares? It's a trivial incident. And it was not the trigger for the invasion, which was bound to happen on August, which was, was slated on August 26th anyway. So who cares? The Glywitz, the Glywitz incident is an irrelevancy. And frankly, the Glywitz incident seems to have played a bigger role in Western propaganda than anything internal to Nazi Germany. I think there was more press coverage of it as a false flag op in the West than there ever was in Nazi Germany. Uh, I mean, none of the Nazis seem to place any significance on it. It didn't affect their invasion plans at all. So if it was an SS hoax, well, okay. <laughs> kind of a pointless hoax since the invasion was coming anyway, but okay. <laughs> um, now here's something I talk. This is... um. Polish-German alliance. Here. Um, damn it. Oh, let's try this. So this is a uh, on a I wasn't able to get this on SciHub. But I am able to um JSTOR does give you let you le read 100 free articles per month so that's how I was able to find this. So this is um um from Bodan Berdowitz, Poland and Hitler's offer of alliance. Um, so I start with this. I had some notes on this. Uh, the German Polish Alliance. So there's a lot of there's a lot of words here. 
there's even some speculation, sake of Bowdoin politic, whatever that is. Um, okay, here we go. But we have some quotes. So, 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 um, During another interview with Waisaki on July 13th, the Fuhrer also extensively discussed the situation in Russia. He was even more outspoken to talk to the new Polish ambassador, Joseph Lipsky, on November 15th, 1933. Any war would only result in the bringing of communism to Europe. The communism which is a terrible danger and against which the chancellor never ceased to fight. Poland is an outpost against Asia. Okay, I think that's, but whatever. Um, the destruction of Poland would be a misfortune for the states, which would consequently become neighbors of Asia. <laughs> the other states would realize Poland's role as an outpost. So aside from this calling the Soviet Union Asia, I mean, I don't know, do we forget that during the Russian Civil War, the Central Asian states literally tried to break off the Soviet Union invaded those to bring them back into the Soviet fold, even though those were just part of Tsarist Russia and not like, <laughs> did we forget that literally the Asia part of the Soviet Union tried to break off during the Russian Civil War, but failed? But he, but whatever, whatever. He's talking about the Soviet Union's a big threat, whatever. Um, there are some better stuff. Um or was it? Um, okay. On January 22nd, Hitler had a talk with Lipsky during a reception at the uh, Imperial Chancellery and once more discussed at length the Russian question and the danger of uh, danger threatening from the East. He called the ambassador's attention to the fact that the Soviet Union had made great progress with her military preparations. That is true. Great progress. This was in what? 1930. Yeah, this was 1933, so this is like just at the beginning of like this happening. Um, and warned that him that the moment might come when, when both Poland and Germany would be forced to defend themselves against aggression from the East. The Fuhrer spoke with disapproval about the supporters of the Rapallo policy. I don't know what that is. Uh, and singled out for criticism General Schleicher, who had wanted to befriend Russia at Poland's expense. So, previews of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but Hitler is saying no. A policy which Hitler considered short-sighted since it would only intensify the Soviet threat, the greatest danger of all to Germany. A few days after this conversation, Goering made one of his famous hunting trips to Poland. The obvious purp purpose of this private visit, which led him to uh, Bielo Bielowiza and to Warsaw, was to ascertain the reaction of Polish official circles to the project of a crusade against the Soviet Union. This was to be not a delicate feeler or sounding, but a clear and urgent invitation. As the Polish White Book shows, Goering was very outspoken in his conversations and outlined far-reaching plans, almost suggesting an anti-Russian alliance and a joint attack on Russia. He went so far as to divide the Soviet territories into spheres of influence and offered the Ukraine to the Poles. While reserving northwestern Russia for Germany. These tempting proposals were coupled with a veiled warning that, theoretically, one could imagine a new partition of Poland by means of German Russian collaboration. So, a little bit of a carrot and stick here. It's interesting, you see these conversations, they're already talking about like. Which which way are we gonna go? Are we are we gonna go Pol Are we gonna go with the Molotov Ribbentrop way? Or are we gonna go with the alliance with Poland? Right? Alliance or war? Alliance or war? That, that is a, that is a very common thing in world history when when two powers are when two states are talking to each other. Alliance or war? Um, although Goering hastened to add that practically it would be impossible to attain that end since a common frontier between the Reich and the Soviet Union would be highly dangerous to Germany. This was 35. Goering's enthusiasm for the um, march in Commune on Moscow seemed to have carried him away during his meeting with Pilsudski, but the marshal had no trouble handling the unceremonious visitor but blah, 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 blah. The embarrassing suggestion of a joint Russian-Polish attack and allusion to an advantageous Poland to Ukraine such an event were definitely countered with irrefutable argument that the Bulls could not support any political schemes which might lead to a revival of tension on our eastern border, that they would have to sleep with their rifles, blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, what else? This this kept going on. The, the Germans kept sending guys out to, to propose these things. They kept being rejected, though. Kept trying to court Poland. Court Poles kept rejecting them. Uh, Hitler, who received Lipsky on May 22nd, uh, this, I think 30, this is 35. Because this is kind of in chronological order, so May 22nd, this is 35. Also refrained from making any proposals, but uttered some caustic remarks about the inept pro-Soviet policy of the German army, and repeatedly declared that he preferred a Polish-German detente to uneasy relations with Russia, which was, in his opinion, an Asiatic country. <laughs> Um, Chateau Artiste, Asiatic, Asiatic. Beck's visit to Berlin in July 1935 provided the Nazi chieftains with an opportunity to find out whether the personal changes in the Polish leadership could be converted to put Germany's advantage. Their expectations that Pelsudski's successors could be easily swayed by Hitler's alluring promises were solely disappointed when Beck could not be persuaded to budge from the rigid attitude adopted by his dead master. Indeed, the very arguments he used uh, were those in which the late marshal had checked Goering's impetuous advances. The pure suggestions that the existing relations between Poland and Germany should be consolidated and that any dangers emerging in the future should be resisted in a spirit of friendship between Berlin and Warsaw were also passed over in silence. The allusions to the necessity of a common stand against the Soviet danger had by now become the standard feature of almost every German-Polish conversation on governmental level. In the opinion of the Nazi leaders, European solidarity ended at the Soviet at the Polish-Soviet frontier, and it was the duty of all civilized nations to put an end to the Bolshevik savagery. As Hans Frank put it in his visit to Warsaw in February 1936, Polish-French-German collaboration was the only way for an effective struggle against the barbarism which would come from the East. His perception. I don't think that's true. I think Germany alone could have taken out the Soviet Union without lend lease and without attacks from the West, but whatever. Uh, the Russian nation had to be... The Russian nation had to be pitied for being lost in the confusion of Bolshevism. But against it, we must defend ourselves with all our strength since it is since it aimed at destroying everything which had been most sacred to us for a thousand years. Ba ba ba. Poland doesn't want to embroil in religious wars between the representative of the opposing ideologies. Well, Poland wanted to be the middleman, and they ended up being no man. Um, something in French. More words. Ribbentrop was more specific in the assertion Poland was menaced by the danger of Bolshevism equally with Germany. By crushing out the reason of the smallest signs of communism. Ba, 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 ba. February 1937, Goering was again in Poland. It's a long conversation with Smidsky, with Smigli Rids, who had recently received the baton of Marshal, assuming dictatorial heirs. This time, the German visitor tried to convince his host that the danger of Poland and Germany existed not only in the form of Bolshevik and communized Russia, but of Russia generally in any form, be it monarchist or liberal. He also stressed Berlin's dependence on Warsaw and voices apprehension that an isolated Poland would be much easier to subdue, and then the whole Russian avalanche would strike directly against the German frontier. Whether Goering's actually afraid of that, I'm not sure, but that is, I mean, that's, a liter that's literally a true statement. That is literally true. If you just look at a map, that is literally true. Um, his thesis that the interests of Poland and Germany were entirely one in opposing the Soviets was, however, not acceptable to Pasolsky's heirs, who saw no necessity of aligning Polish and German policy. Thus, it was quite superfluous to determine how far a policy of collaboration could be worked out. These considerations were also instrumental in defining Warsaw's attitude toward the anti common term pact. Rommer, a confidant of Ribbentrop, had held conversation with Count Alfred Pataki, Count, 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 something of Galicia, blah, 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 left Poland, convinced, convinced of some Neanderthal words. Okay. Uh, and nevertheless, the Polish leaders expected that they sh would be invited to join this alleged alliance for the salvation 
of the most sacred possession of European culture from the threat of communist nihilism, especially after the German-Japanese agreement had been expanded by Italy's accession November 37. Already on November 4th, Goring reiterated in his conversation with Sembeck, the old assurances, that the Third Reich was not, would not collaborate with either the Soviets or with Russia in general, irrespective of her internal regime, and added that Poland could be satisfied with her position on the Baltic and should aspire to an access to the Baltic Sea. I believe Hit um, Hitler, I believe Goring is referring to Poland, she could get some stuff up here that this Gdynia thing would become irrelevant because you'll get Riga. In order to quash any rumors of the Poles that, that would associate themselves with the anti-Soviet coalition, Beck advised on November 9th all Polish diplomatic missions abroad that no proposals to join the back had been received by Warsaw and that in any case Poland would, could not be party to a protocol in view of her special position as neighbor of the USSR, as well as her objection in principle to the formation of any bloc. Her objection in principle to the formation of any bloc. So this this is Poland thinking, oh, we're a great power. We don't need to join, we don't need to join a coalition. We're a great see, not even Germany was this delusional. Right? Not even Germany was so delusional as to imagine that they that they could survive independently against any coalition or raid against them. Hitler gave up the the, the South Tyrol, this sort of area here. He gave this up to Italy in order to try to get Italy on side. Right? He's trying he's trying to 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 get Poland on side. Right? He was working with he, he worked with um Horthy to, to get Hungary on side. Okay? So Germany, a country which was, if anything, far more materially capable of going it alone, was far less delusional in the belief that they could go it alone than the Poles. The more I read about Poles and their diplomats and their, and their leaders, the more negative my attitude becomes of the Pol of of the Polish leadership at this time. The, po the attitude of the Poles made any further discussion useless. Smithley Ridd said, I would rather I'd rather my country be burned to the ground and ruled by the Bolsheviks than make any deals with Hitler. Blah blah blah. Um he would have the Russian project will require actuality after the settlement of the Czech problem. Yes, the polls. The thing is, this is a lot of conversations, and people like they, they like say things that are like. Remember, when all the with, with all these any individual proposals or any individual statement, it's like a man says word, a man says thing to some other person, who knows. He's saying what the other what he thinks the other person wants to hear. Um, but the point is, the Germans had been pushing forth these alliance feelers and alliance proposals since 1933. Literally when Hitler comes to power. And this is happening even in like, what is this, October 38. They're still trying. So the so you can't say that the Germans didn't give it a good try. And what were they demanding? What, what were they freaking demanding? And when did this get scuppered? When did all of this, when did the Germans finally change their tune on any of this regarding Poland? It was March 31st. It was March 31st when this all ended. Even then, even then it didn't entirely end. Even with the Molotov, right? After, after the British war guarantee for Poland, that's when German policy changed. That's when German... Germany started to go anti-Poland after the war guarantee. But even then, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact wasn't signed until August 20th. So we're getting pretty close to the war when before Germany is even ostensibly reaching the point of no return for any kind of detente with Poland. And even after the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, even after the invasion is slated for August 26th, they, Hitler continues to delay it in the hopes that Poland will agree to something. So, no. No, 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 no. So, 
But just as, a, as an aside, there's very little that I have read that the that the polls were like. This is something that I see on like the Quora morons is to say, well, the reason we polls didn't align with Hitler was we have moral opposition to what he was doing to the Jews. <laughs> that is the most. That is the most ridiculous kind of retcon that you any poll that says that is is so full of shit. I mean, maybe we could go into that, but but by all measure, the anti the anti Jewish laws in Poland were more severe than the anti Jewish laws in Germany, and in fact, there were separate conferences that Hitler would would have with um, I don't know if it was. Pilsitsky or Smigley, whoever the, the 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 Polish PM was at the time, Chancellor or whatever they called him, um, right? They, they 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 had conferences about how how to get rid of their Jews, and Hitler, you know, he was recognized. Look, Poland has a lot more Jews than Germany, um, but Germany is committed to getting the Jews out of Europe. So we will. So so Hitler was actually extending, you know, as part of. He was willing to expend German resources to help Poland get rid of their Jews, right? And this was not some, you know, and, and the Poles didn't go, gasp, how dare you? The Jews are an integral and important and central part of the, the fabric of the nation of Poland. Like, the Poles never did that, you know? So that, I mean, that was, that was, that was that's just mind-blowing this, this idea that the poles were like muffed at at, at the anti-jewish policies of the nazis like it, they, they they were of one mind on that if anything the poles were more heavy-handed but in, in the pre in, in the pre-war period during the war period now you're getting into the holocaust debate which has to be dealt with at its but we but i can say sort of here in sort of a limited state with some degree of certainty that the Poles were not muffed by the anti-Jewish laws in Germany. Now, that was something that the West cared about, and that's something that retrospectively westernized Poles say they care about, but it's not something that Poles at the time ever cared about. Um, so, and here's something I want to say, is that they'll say, People will say, well, the Poles were right to not make a deal with Hitler because we know what comes later. Right? We know Hitler was untrustworthy later. But then, <laughs> like, okay, what comes later? You know, what is, what exactly, you know, I think we've dealt with, with Ch the Chechia. we dealt with Chechia. We've dealt with the intransigence and you know, incorrigible parochialism of Poland. Okay. So what, what, what is the untrustworthiness and what is the warmongeringness of Germany? Aside from war with the Soviet Union, which, you know, you, you may say that's the warmongeringness, his plans for invasion of the Soviet Union. I'm against that because I think, because I believe in the, in the general plan of the East, I believe in the anti-Slavic butchering or whatever, which, First off, that was that was something penned by Rosenberg, who Hitler had sidelined by then. But anyway, um, but in terms of what I like, okay, well, what comes next? What exactly is so untrustworthy about about Hitler's warmongering? Because because we dealt with Poland and we dealt with Czechia. Slovakia is an ind independent state, sort of. You know, Tizo is working with Hitler. Okay, Tizo's working with Hitler. I mean, we haven't established that Hitler is some criminal at this point. So, no, working with Hitler is not some criminal act. If Tizo believes Hitler is in the right regarding the Polish question, letting German troops go through Slovakia, I mean, that's not... Like, I didn't see anything criminal about that. Okay. Same with Belarus, letting uh, Russian troops go through Belarus to Ukraine. I mean, okay, the Belarusian leader, I th I think Russia is in the right on Ukraine, so that's not something terrible about what the Belar Bel Belarusian government has done. But um, 
But if we say what, well, we know Hitler was dishonest because what comes, okay, what comes later? What? What comes later? What comes after this? We've already, we've already demolished this. We've already de demolished the idea of, that the Munich Agreement was violated. It wasn't. We've already demolished the, the myth that Hitler was, you know, dead set on war against Poland. He was not. He was flexible on the matter and was certainly in the beginning much more predisposed to an alliance than to a carve up. Right. Now, as you see in the negotiations, there are mentions of a carve up as kind of a as kind of a stick to, to offset the carrot, right? And and we ultimately know that's what the Nazis had to resort to. I mean, it's, I don't think anyone would say that Hitler was pleased with making the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. I don't think anyone believes that Hitler was a happy camper to give Stalin the Baltic states in Bessarabia. But that's what it ended up being because Pol the Poles wouldn't play, play ball because the Poles thought they were... Because the thoughts, the polls thought they were bigger than they really were. But but it was right for the polls to resist, not the Nazis, because we know what comes later. Well, what comes later? The invasion of Denmark, the invasion of Norway. Okay, we know what we know what the invasion of Denmark and Norway is. We know that Britain planned to do something involving Norway, whether it was a full-on invasion or just an occupation of Norway. We know why that was. Okay. We know why the Germans had to invade Denmark because they didn't have a navy, right? And so, in order to keep, keep, in order to have supply go from, from, not from Hamburg, okay, but from like Kiel, to Oslo to go here, okay, they needed to control that water. How do they control that water? Their navy can't. They need planes. They need airplanes. Airplanes have limited range. They need to take. Well, this is a bad map, but Jutland is sort of up here. So they need Jutland. And actually, when they invaded Denmark, like. The day they took Jutland, they had like an airbase pre, like almost pre-built, right? They had and and they and they built it in in a in a remarkable period of time, um, to to control the these sea lanes through over the air. So, if you want to say that that's bad or that's wrong, Germany shouldn't have done. Germany just should have let Britain just land in Norway and do whatever they want with Norway, lose half their iron ore. That's the right thing for Hitler to have done. And certainly Hitler was in no justification to invade the sovereign country of Denmark in order to get to Norway. Right. Okay, but certainly you can say whatever you want about that. But certainly there were no plans to invade Denmark before the British started effing around in Norway, and particularly effing around around Narvik. So that war <laughs> was a product. The invasion of Denmark was because of what the British were doing in Narvik. Okay. And plus, most people, when they talk about Hitler, the warmonger, they, they, some of the real dumb, especially like the boomers, and by boomers, I mean people who are actually boomers, but also boomers, not just an age. It's, it's, a, it's a state of mind. There, there are spiritual boomers, people in their, who are in their 20s who are boomers, who, who, will say, who will say that, for whatever reason, believe that Hitler invaded Denmark just because he could and he wanted to and he wanted, get, you know, he wanted a big empire to control all of Europe or whatever. Um, okay. So Denmark and Norway, that's not evidence of some grand campaign of aggression Europe-wide, right? other than the invasion of the Soviet Union, which Hitler copped to. You know, Hitler said, yeah, I'm building my army for the Soviet Union. You look at the German Navy. It's designed to deal with the Soviet Navy. It's a, it's a small surface fleet. It's not a U-boat fleet. U-boats is what you would need against Britain. Surface ships are going to be useless against Britain because the Britons because the because you'll never match the British surface fleet. So why do they have a big surface fleet? The only reason to have a big surface fleet is the Baltic is against the Soviets. Um. Okay, but then but then Hitler invaded Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg, and that's regrettable. I agree. I agree. It's, it's, it's a regrettable. It's a sad state of affairs. It's a sad state of affairs that Britain and France forced Germany to do that because that was the only way they were ever going to take out France. Because guess what? Guess what, Frenchies? You know, it, this is what's so amazing. You know, the Fr Frenchies, they build this Maginot Line, right? 
And it's so, and, and it's super effective. Like people who say the national line didn't work. No, this national line was super effective. It's, it stopped them cold. As, a, as an aside, maybe I should do another presentation on just how effective forts are. Just how like, what a wonderful investment. What a wonderful military investment forts are, right? Because you can invest in a fort. There was a fort at around Modlin, sort of up in here. It's built in like 18, like 1810 or something. And it stopped like, it stopped a German tank column for like three days. An investment from, from 1810 was still paying dividends in 1939. Okay. So you talk about forts being ineffective, like shut up. The Ger and more re more approximately, the Germans built the Siegfried Line here, sort of in 1936 to 30. I forget when they built the Siegfried Line. Um, but it was shortly after taking the Rhineland. And this Siegfried Line was still effective in 1944. It didn't stop them cold, but it stopped them for a while. It stopped the, the U.S. and the U.K. troops when they were going through France here. You know, it, they, they, they had to pause for a few months. To, to prepare for the assault on the Siegfried Line because the Siegfried Line was a bunch of, you know, effective forts. And ima imagine if instead of investing in the Siegfried Line, those 1936, 37 investments were, it went into, you know, biplanes or Panzer Ones. Those things would be useless, right? Arms from 1936, aside from literally like rifles, like giving a man with a rifle. Um, basically, forts take a lot longer to go obsolete, and that's why they're such a great investment. The French were building the Maginot Line in the like 1927 to 34 or something. Um, those kinds of investments would have been obsolete. If they if they're invested into say airplanes during, in those years, those investments would be obsolete by the time the Germans invaded. The Maginot Line was not obsolete because it's a fort, and big blocks of concrete and protruding guns have sort of a timeless quality to them. Um, anyway, so they build this Maginot Line, okay, and what does the Maginot Line do? What what does the Maginot Line do? It basically guarantees that the only way that the only way that the Germans can ever hope to take out France and break the blockade, because when Britain or France go to war with Germany, that's, you know, they're starving them out, right? They control the sea and they so and they control any land access through here. Italy's not in the war because Mussolini's, you know, he's riding the fence at this moment. So Mussolini's still neutral. Um so, but basically, Germany's blocked off from the West. So they're blockading Germany. They're doing a blockade strategy. So they're just going to sit, right? The only way Germany can ever hope to break the blockade to some degree is to take out France. How do they take out France? They have to go through these countries. So basically, Britain and France's strategies, they doom Belgium and Hulk. Now, so, so does Germany's strategy. Germany's strategy also dooms Belgium and Holland. That much is true. But Germany didn't start the war, right? France and Britain started this war in the West. And their starting of that war doomed Belgium and Holland. Now, you can say, well, Germany's the bad guy. because they. Why? Because Germany pulled the trigger. Germany was German troops were the ones who actually invaded Belgium and Holland. So they're they're the chief culprit, right? Right. Germany is the chief culprit because they didn't have the luxury of just sitting back. Right. Germany was because Germany is in a more precarious strategic situation than Great Britain and France. They had they had to engage in more tactical aggression. And so that's so that that's why they're the bad guy because they went through Belgium and Holland, right? And certainly, aggression, quote unquote, against Britain and France. That's no, that's that's a war you guys started. Shut up. Um, what about Yugoslavia? This is another thing. Um, weird, inexplicable. Like I talked about Poland having these weird, almost inexplicably stupid foreign policy decisions that 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 doomed their, their country. Yugoslavia did the same thing. Um because 
Mussolini was invading Greece. Why was he invading Greece? That's it wasn't completely it was it was pretty belligerent but it wasn't completely without any cause whatsoever but but we're talking about nazi aggression so okay mussolini being being il dunce um is not germane to that basically italy's at war with greece right and that's not something hitler wanted hitler was famously quite pissed at this um the problem is Yugoslavia joins Greece. British troops were in here. British troops were in Macedonia. Okay. So British troops were in Greece. They were also in Macedonia. Okay. So British troops are running around in a country that has a border with Germany. So Yugoslavia hasn't declared war. So it's, it's, <laughs> It's kind of a kind of a situation because Yugoslavia hasn't declared war on Germany. Why would they? That wouldn't end well. Um, but Yugoslavia is letting in troops from a country that Germany is at war with to help fight another country that Germany is allied with. So I don't I don't think any. There is no situation. If Britain was in any situation like that, they would invade the analog to Yugoslavia. There is this is this is ridiculous. Like the idea that that, that there was form. Now I'm not talking about field atrocities or claims that that the that the Germans empowered the Croats to to massacre Serbs, which. Again, I I always take with a grain of salt, right? You know me, I take atrocity stories with a grain of salt. Um, but I'm just talking about sort of the state, I'm talking about state level military aggression here. And this is this is justified. I'm it's it's justified. It just is. There's no other situation like that where Britain and France, and certainly the United States, the the would not do that. So so what? What is the what? What is the? And again, you know, you can you can talk about the either the field atrocities or the quote unquote Holocaust. But just talking about state level military aggression, saying Hitler's dishonest about that, or Hitler was a warmonger on that front. What are you talking about? Are you talking about occupying the Rhineland? No, I don't, like nobody says that. Okay. Are talking about Austria? Right? That's not true at all. <laughs> Maybe, right? Austria was unified with uni with Germany, and this union was ruled by an Austrian king, Hitler. Okay. Uh Sudeti? No. I mean Sudeti, that was completely first off, that was legally agreed to by Britain and France and Germany. Okay. The Czechs weren't consulted. Why would they be? Um so no, uh, what about what about the the uh, the quasi annexation of of Czechia, Bohemia, Moravia? No, that wasn't any that fell into Hitler's lap. Hitler didn't do hardly anything at all. He funded he support he okay. Hitler was a little bit cute in that he was sending material support to Tiso in Slovakia. So okay. And, and you could use that as, but look, why, why did that work? <laughs> like, why did that work? If you think, oh, Tizo or Hitler's support for Tizo was what broke apart Czechoslovakia and therefore Hitler is responsible. Okay. The, the only reason that would work is because Czechoslovakia is, is a, is a fabrication in the first place. That's the only reason it, it could work. Um, okay. Poland. No, we've, we've, been over Poland. Okay, what about the invasion? What about the wars against France and Britain? Well, no. I mean, I mean, a country declares war on you. Why are why are they attacking us? You know, okay, so no, that's retarded. Okay, what about the Soviet Union? Is that is that Hitler's um belligerence and aggression? Maybe. Maybe. Now, as it actually played out. In reality, and this may be like a subject for another stream, 
that Hitler was complete, that Hitler was right to invade the Soviet Union. He was right to invade it when he did. And, and the, at least at the level of state level military aggression, it was justified. And I believe the Soviets were, there is non-trivial evidence that the Soviets were gearing up for some sort of incursion into the German borders. Was it, or into the, the German occupied borders? Was it going to be a, a full on, you know, war military invasion? Was Stalin just bluffing by putting troops so close to the border, by bunching troops so far forward, which actually made them vulnerable at the initial invasion because the airfields, for example, were overcrowded. It's one example of the problems of doing that. But was it... Um, anyways, certainly th th that's another ball, ball of wax unto itself, the invasion of the Soviet Union. So, okay... Well, given that all that is basically knocked out, what is the basis of Hitler, the warmonger, on the level of state-level aggression? What is what is the evidence of that? It's Denmark, Norway, Norway, and the Low Countries. That's it. That's it. The Soviet Union, that's something else. And I think most people agree that Hitler, would, at, at the time he was in, the situation he was in, in June of 1941... Hitler basically had to invade the Soviet Union because otherwise, what? Wait, just 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 sit and wait for them to invade. Then you're the good guy. Like Hitler was never going to be portrayed as the good guy, so so you might as well invade. So um, that's that's literally. So when you actually break it down, when you actually deconstruct sort of the initial arguments for Hitler's warmongering, Chechia and Poland, that those are a fabrication. Yugoslavia is totally justified. And we also know that's not even something Hitler wanted to do. And that and that's orthodox. That's just straight up orthodox history that Hitler did not want to go into Yugoslavia. It was, it was a pointless diversion and pointless waste of of, of the resources that went into in, into any operation. Where you, when you have to move troops around, you're using fuel, right? So so yeah, um, but this is it. This is literally it. Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg, Denmark, Norway. That's it. Okay. What's left? What is left? Peace proposals. And I had this sort of on the screen here. Heavens no. You can see this sort of up at the top center by the monkey oh <laughs> actually I, I didn't even intend that it's, it's between the two monkeys <laughs> i literally i literally didn't intend it from throwing this together heavens no they would accept immediately what is that quote from what is that quote from um time rainbow at the citadel Monday, August 30th, 1943. Old World City of Quebec, blah, blah, blah. Gaily dressed inhabitants. Until they discover that women calls you a sword. Everybody laughed, gagged, credited Churchill before he left England. Interviewer. Will you offer peace terms to Germany? Heavens no. They would accept immediately. Um, I kind of wanted to get this going. So this is from um, Colored Text site. A bunch of these things. However, I closed it. I freaking closed it. Hold on. I'm sorry, guys. I'm really sorry. I need to open this. There's a file, there's a, a PDF. Unfortunately, it's it's Kindle. Kindle. Shut up. It's Kindle. I hate Kindle. But that's the only way I could get it. I couldn't get a PDF anywhere else. It's only available on Amazon and through their their this Kindle crap. Um location. So here we have some okay. It's, Here's two of them. 
Here's two proposals. There's also something you could look up the uh, Hitler's last appeal to reason. Uh, ba -ba -ba. See, this is another reason I, I hate Kindle. They don't have, what page is this on? What page is this on? I don't know. They have location. This is location 1345. Okay, whatever. Um, Hitler, according to his emissary Weissauer, feels responsible for the future of the white race. He wishes for sincere friendship with England. He wishes for the restoration of peace, but the ground must be prepared. Only after such careful preparation can official discussions begin. Up until then, it must be a condition that conversations be kept unofficial and secret. Big mistake, Hitler. You should have shouted this from the rooftops. But, that said, Mallet reported Halifax Five Point Peace Plan. Excuse me, Halifax. This is definitely not Halifax Peace Plan. Holy shit. Um, Mallet reported Hitler's Five Point Peace Plan as follows. One, the British Empire remains with all colonies and mandates. Okay. Two, the continental supremacy of Germany will not be called into questions. Three, all questions concerning the Mediterranean and the French, Belgian, and Dutch colonies are open to discussion. Okay. Remember, this is an opening gambit. This is not, this is not sign this or else. This is, this is his proposal and then you enter into discussion. Four, Poland. There must be a Polish state. Five, Czechoslovakia must belong to Germany. Now, this is from um, Mallet, and Mallet is saying Czechoslovakia. I don't, I think this is Mallet being a retard. I think, because, because, because he, he keeps saying, because he says Czechoslovakia. And he's saying this in 19, Czechoslovakia, what's that? What's Czech, what is a Czechoslovakia? Czech, there's Slovakia. There's, there's the independent state of Slovakia, and there's a protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. What is this Czechoslovakia you refer to? It doesn't exist. So must so so is so this is why it's kind of kind of I don't like Mallet saying this because is Hitler saying that now he's going to invade and annex Slovakia? Is I, I really doubt that. Like, if Hitler wanted to invade and annex Slovakia, he would have already done so. He, so, I don't know what. I think what he means is that the, that the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia will remain. That's what he should have wrote. I think that's what he means. But, but, but this is why it's confusing. Czechoslovakia doesn't exist. It must belong to Germany. Are you saying Hitler's... So, yeah, whatever. But those are, his, those are the, the terms according to Weissauer. Further expanded on these terms, revealing Hitler's intention at Weissar conveyed them to uh, Ekeberg. Ekeberg was a Swedish judge, sort of a big shot Swedish judge. Um, that the other European states occupied by Germany, Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, and France, would have their sovereignty restored. It was only owing to the present military situation that Germany now has to continue to occupy them until the peace. Weissauer said that Hitler wished to reestablish the sovereignty of all the countries on a permanent basis. He has no interest in the internal affairs of these states. Germany's interest is to prevent a fresh war as Europe needs 100 years of peace. Uh, this, oh, by the way, this is from Hitler. <laughs> And it didn't even say what this is from. This is from Himmler's Secret War, Covert Peace Negotiations of Heinrich Himmler. And, and this is more focused on stuff that comes a lot later. I'm talking about stuff that that's coming in uh, 19... This is 1940, obviously. Um, Mallet, a career diplomat, unused to the shady world of secret peace negotiations, concluded his report with the comment, I'm naturally rather uncomfortable at having become even to the small extent involved in this mysterious proceeding. Please forgive my bad typing, but I felt it best to show this to nobody. Well, he showed it to somebody, and now he's showing it to us. <laughs> so, sorry, Mallet. I mean, he's dead now, but sorry to, to the to the spirit of Mallet up in, up in the heavens, or, or Stovacor, or Valhalla, wherever you are. <laughs> You're probably not in Valhalla, buddy. You're working for the British. Um, 
it's a, uh, this is this is the author's text. Um, okay, what was the next one? Fifteen forty-seven. It's another. This is a lot of scuttlebutt about. Is it, the theory here is what 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 um. The author, I forget the author's name of this book. Holy shit. But what the author here of Himmler's Second War, he's saying he's going through, this is just a bunch of like basically British intelligence is using Hitler's desire for peace to to basically um, to send mixed messages to get Hitler to basically step off the gas for a little while and, and weaken um, him tactically. Basically, use Hitler's desire for peace against him, um, but but the problem is that's not that's kind of a long drawn out, and he has to he has to connect a lot of things and look at this agent said here, this agent said here, which all so he's connecting dots, which I'm not saying isn't isn't true, but I'm saying it's long and it's and that is not a operational argument because it's because you have to connect a lot of dots so in the field when dealing with somebody who's a, who's like a hostile skeptic to this stuff that's not a good argument because it's, it's too complicated and you have to connect dots and you have to go through like archives and they can accuse you of cherry picking communiques and whatever um, so i kind of stay away from that now. okay um what is this also present at the meeting with Papal Nuncio. So this is from Papal Nuncio. Who's Papal Nuncio? God. This is also kind of why I don't like books. Because, like, to understand what's going on, you have to read the whole book. You can't just read the thing that, that is important and, and and tracks. You have to read all of my my connect-the-dot theories about German or about British special agents. Which I'm not saying is false, but it's like... Get to something usable, buddy. Okay. Upon sitting down to discussions with the papal nuncio, it soon became apparent to both Hor and Hilgarth that this was not just another mediocre appeal for peace by the well-meaning intermediary. Rather, they were sitting before an emissary direct from Hitler, Hess, and Haushofer, who brought an extremely comprehensive peace offer specifically for Samuel Hor's ears only. Mistake! Shout this from the rooftops, Hitler. Hilgarth was to report. At the meeting, the papal nuncio informed Sir Samuel that he had been requested to communicate the following peace offer on behalf of the German government representative, Ambassador Jai Berger, German word Foreign Police Office. Okay, again, more more of this NATO crap, right? Why why are the Germans having to work through through the the Vatican? Right? Why are they having to work through some some bishop or nuncio or whatever? Why why are they having to work through these these guys? Why why can't they just talk to Britain? Why are they having to do this roundabout crap? Same thing happened in World War One. They're trying to work through the Americans to try to talk the lunatics in London. Representative Haushofer, who made the last round of peace offer. Um the nuncio informed the ambassador of German's government's in Sierra Wish and the hostilities, and that he had been asked to hand the following details for transmission to a party who would be willing to act upon them. One, a confidential meeting as soon as possible in Switzerland between the rep representatives who were prepared to negotiate. Two, Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, and France would be independent free states able to choose their constitution and government, but opposition to Germany must be excluded and assurances of non-retaliation given. Germany would withdraw her military forces, would not claim mil military concessions in these countries, and is prepared to negotiate a formal reparation for damage inflicted during conquest. All aggressive weapons to, uh, to be destroyed and then armed forces reduced to corresponding with the economic and strategic requirements of each country. I assume he's talking about, not talking about Germany. I, I, at this point, I assume he's not talking about a German disarmament because they are bound to a war with the Soviet Union at some point in the future. Four, Germany re requests the return of her former colonies, but claims, but would advance no other territorial claims. Southwest Africa might be might not be claimed. Germany might consider the payment of indemnity for improvements affected of the colonies since 1918 and the purchase of property from present owners who might desire to leave. 
So basically, Germany is willing to pay for any post-1918 improvements to land that was taken from them at Versailles. I mean, that said, okay, this is a little bit of speculation on my part. If Britain agreed to everything but the return of colonies, Hitler would sign that in a heartbeat. Hitler would not say, no, the war must continue because I want Namibia. I want Tanzania. I, I, but, but you know what? Like all these things, we'll never know because the British never came to terms, right? So we'll never know. So you can say, oh, Britain would not have, you know, Hitler would not have backed off of, of the colonial claims. Well, we'll never know because you never, you never even bothered. Uh, political independence and national identity of a Polish state to be restored, but the territory occupied by the Soviet Union is to be excluded from discussions. So, Czechoslovakia would not be prevented from developing her national character. Again, these people saying Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia doesn't exist anymore, buddy. But anyway, uh, Czech... I hate this. Go away. Go away. Czechoslovakia would not be prevented from developing her national character, but is to remain under the protection of the right. Okay, I I hate these these dumb papal nuncio. Just I wish you would I wish you would have have said what is actually meant, which is Hitler will maintain the status quo for Slovakia and Bohemian Moravia. Okay. That's what sh should have been said. By saying Czechoslovakia, you're... Okay, so we're going to... Are you saying you want to reunify Czechoslovakia? Is that what you're saying? That's almost certainly not what he's saying. He's saying... He said maintain the status quo. That's what he's saying. Okay. Um, six, greater German economic solidarity should be pursued. And by the solution of important economic questions, solved by negotiation, blah, blah. Okay, so this is just... Pablum. This is just platitudes um but the other things the polish state vacating the west the colonies i think germany i think hitler is not going to commit to the colonies <laughs> i don't think that's going to be a sticking point um but yeah that's that's the term those are the terms so um but what do we get instead what we get instead you could say well hitler would have gone back on his words because he's untrustworthy why why is he untrustworthy where's the untrustworthiness there is none all you have is hitler lied to chamberlain's face and said no chamberlain i don't i don't intend to have any more advances in, in ter 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 territorial advances in europe you know, and no, I will not put that in writing and I will not sign that statement. So, which he didn't and didn't happen. There are no treaty violations. At least, I, I don't know, there's probably some like the Rapallo or the Carmo treaties or something. He maybe violated some water wave, um, but he didn't violate Munich, okay? And Hitler never violated Versailles. Because vi Versailles, that's another thing we talk about, that Hitler violated Versailles. Well, so did France and Britain by not by not reducing their arms production as much as they were supposed to, according to the Treaty of Versailles. And by, and by the time and by the time Hitler occupied the Rhineland, obviously France had forsworn Versailles. So Versailles was was done. Um, so Hitler did not violate Versailles. Um, France and Britain had already given their consent to the annexation of Austria, which was a which was which would have been a violation of Versailles. Okay, but if it's a violation of Versailles, then why aren't France and Britain doing anything about it? Because they're not enforcing Versailles because they don't agree. You know what else was a violation of Versailles? The German, German, the Anglo-German Naval Agreement. That was a violation of Versailles. So was, this, so was the Sudeti. That was a violation. So, so the French and British had long since, they, they, weren't, they weren't upholding to Versailles anyway. So whatever. So there, so that's not, so there's no, that's not dishonesty. There's no dishonesty regarding the Sudeti. That was an agreement. Hitler stuck by it. There's no dishonesty regarding Chechia. There's no dishonesty. There's certainly no dishonesty regarding Poland. 
where's the lie in terms of state level military aggression which is what i'm talking about here it's nowhere hitler didn't start the war hitler proved he could be dealt with hitler kept his word to, to franco to mussolini to horthy right to um what's his face the the dictator of romania And the thing is, even if you think, let's say you think Hitler's untrustworthy. Let's say you really believe in, 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 all, in all the myths. Hitler's untrustworthy. And then you get this peace proposal. I'm willing to get out of France, Belgium, Denmark, and Norway. And let's say you accept that. Okay, now what? What, what do you think? Do you think Hitler's going to go, psych? Like, let, let's say Hitler starts, they, because in order for the war to end, obviously German troops are evacuating, right? Because Britain's not gonna gonna leave a war footing or start demobilizing their forces until German troops are out of France, the Low Countries, and Scandinavia, right? So you don't have to demobilize anything until Germany until the Germans have actually vacated these areas. So even if you think Hitler is untrustworthy, okay, now what are you thinking? Are you thinking that oh, once then then we're gonna demobilize because Germany left those areas? First off, Hitler's not even asking you to demobilize. That's, there, there's nothing, at least in his initial gambit, where he says, and Britain must demobilize. Hitler, Hitler that's, not, that's not a requirement. You can maintain your, Britain could maintain her war footing even after Germany has, has vacated all these territories. At, le at least there's nothing, now, now maybe you could speculate that Hitler would demand British demobilization once he got to the Beast Talks, but there's nothing in the opening, in, in the opening proposals that, that says that. So, so what the hell? Why this stonewalling? Heavens no, they would accept immediately. That's why. Churchill wanted war. And he got his war. And that and, and the Empire, oh, he loved the Empire so much. Oh, wonderful Churchill. He loved the Empire. The great British Empire. Beacon of civilization unto the world. Oh man. Well, I guess it was worth it to him to hand over half of Europe to the Bolsheviks, right? It was worth it. You know, let Stalin rule everything. Have Roosevelt, who was openly hostile to the British Empire, Stalin, who was openly hostile to the British Empire, not just in a, in a practical, geopolitical, geostrategic sense, but Stalin was ideologically, or we could say religiously opposed to the British Empire. Sign with those guys who hate your guts. Spurn a guy who loves Britain, who idolizes Britain, idolizes the British Empire. In his peace proposal, I didn't say that here, but there's, there are other peace proposals in like that Hitler even offered to send troops to help protect the British Empire should they be attacked by, say, Japan or Italy, you know. Because there, there were speculations at the time that that some that that Japan might get aggressive in Asia. So <laughs> it, it's really kind of, kind of crazy when you actually break these things down. None of it it's, it's not true. Even the the, ba the those basic beliefs of like Hitler having um, being being a high state level ag aggressor. At most, you could say that was regard that was that might have been true regarding the Soviet Union, and this stream has been going on for a long time, and I need to end it eventually. Um, but I think maybe in the next stream I'll, I talk may talk about the Soviet Union stuff, right? The myth, the myth that th that there here's another myth: there were no negotiations between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union; that it was that it was, it was to be a, a death war to the end. That's that's a myth. That's a lie. There were negotiations. There were talk. There were more negotiations between the Nazis and the Soviets than there were between 
the Nazis and the Brits once the war started. Okay. So the idea that there's more, in terms of who's actually incorrigible, the West is more incorrigible than either Stalin or Hitler. So, anyway, um, back to chat. I guess I'm um, turning down the stream. I'm gonna check for a few more uh, white power chats here. Um, I want to see. I, I need to check the entropy as well. Um, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I got a few. Um, okay, ten dollars. Admiral snack bar. One. Any way to get rid of, of fabled and racist in the cozy chat? They're spamming like mad, too. A Hoi 4 multiplayer stream win. Um, I don't want to do a, a Hoi 4 multiplayer You know what would be a, a great Hoi 4 multiplayer stream to do? You know what, Well, you know what would be better than a Hoi 4 multiplayer stream would be a Victoria 2 multiplayer stream. Because Victoria 2, I think the engine of Victoria 2 is more conducive to actual humans doing random things. Whereas in Hoi 4, you can really fuck things up with with stupid or unexpected human behavior. To, you know. Um but a Hoi 4 but but a Hoi 4 multiplayer stream that I think would actually be more fun would actually be an old world blues multiplayer stream. Um for, for a few reasons. Um one in old world blues the country there's a lot more um viable countries Whereas in Hoi 4, there's like Germany, Italy, France, Britain, Soviet Union, US, Japan. There's like six. Whereas in Old War Blues, all the countries are so small that it's that, that basically anyone, any country, just about, I mean, some are, you know, the, the Blue Rose Society is not viable. But um, any country in Old World Blues, if it's if it's led by a human, is basically viable, right? Even those with a generic focus tree. Um, so I would I would prefer a an old world blues multiplayer stream. If there's a World War II one, I don't know, man. There's so many like there's so many pros. There's so many Hearts of Iron 4 pros who know the meta. And I don't want to play your meta. I don't want to learn your meta or have meta divisions and like no, <laughs> so I don't want to do that. Okay, um, $3 from Insurgent uh, Honor. Please mod someone, anyone in the chat. Jews fabled and niggers rapists are trashing it. Most of us would like to engage with your content. Yeah, there is a lot of... I actually have been looking at the spam. At the, at, at the spam. <laughs> I haven't been looking at the chat. So, um... um uh, rapist is getting a timeout. Uh, fabled is getting a timeout. Yeah, I need to mod someone. Ohio Hillbilly is getting timed out. So, this, this, these are 24 hour timeouts. You're being put in timeout. Sorry, guys. All right. Um, okay. I, I need to go through through the chat. People paid paid money for things. Um, okay, ten dollars from Admiral Snackbar. This this showed up again, so he double posted this. I don't know if this was accidental. Um, Admiral Snackbar, if you are here and you accidentally double posted and wish for me to refund it, say so. Because after a certain number of hours, this goes through Stripe and then this goes to my bank account. So, oh, someone has to be mod. Okay. You're a mod, Phoenix. Um, if you abuse it, you won't be a mod. Okay. Um, so, Admiral Snack Bar, if you're here, you need to tell me pretty quickly because this is going to be going through the, the, the bank thing eventually. Um, Admiral Snack Bar. See, because he double he he put two donations for ten dollars, and they both say the same thing. So I think this may be accidental. So there we go. All right, um, ten dollars from Bryce Clarkson. Another stream you should pick apart the oversimplified World War II videos on YouTube. It's short but packed full of lies and has a million views. 
I freaking need to do that. The problem is, you know, I don't know. I know that 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 um that uh that that Holocaust uh skepticism, that being a a Holocaust skeptic is uh is is a bannable offense on on YouTube. Is the stuff regarding Hitler's mil like state level military aggression is arguing against that a bannable offense. Certainly it is not, that part is not as opposed, but maybe, I don't know. I should give it a try though. That, that should be, that should be what I do. And if, and if that's allowed, if I'm allowed to defend the Nazi regime on the, on the level of uh, state level military aggression claims, then perhaps, uh, then, then, then perhaps that could be a meaningful way back on, onto YouTube. Because right now on YouTube, they banned hereditarianism, basically. But they updated the TOS that hereditarianism is banned. Obviously, Holocaust skepticism is banned. So what can I say that's meaningful in any one way that isn't banned? I mean, I could do like sort of gateway pundit, like, but also like vax skepticism is banned. So like <laughs> everything's banned. Um... But th but but this here, what I talked about here, some of the stuff here may not be banned. Obviously, it, I can't be talking extemporaneously on YouTube. This is streaming on YouTube, and it will be taken down immediately. Um, but but maybe yeah, maybe in like scripted videos, obviously, I could. It's more it's easier to avoid the landmines in scripted videos than when I'm just rambling here and I end up like blurting things out. Um, but yeah, I could. Uh, that that is a great suggestion, Bryce Clarkson, and thank you for the ten dollars. Um, okay. Insurgent honor and most high power nitro. Okay, that's it. That's it. That was um that was the stream for the day. I wonder actually. Wait a minute. I wonder if um. Cause like cause like Ralph isn't streaming. I I've noticed. Because like Ralph gets like eight hundred, so maybe basically there's a bunch of Ralphies. Ralphies, I'm calling you Ralphies. <laughs> maybe maybe there's a bunch of Ralphies coming in here, um, and that's why they're getting this bam. And and the Ralphies with their with their anti intellectual um, attitudes, <laughs> because they, they hate they hate brain cells. Like all all Ralph all Ralph report viewers, um, they they despise um, cognition. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I, uh, that's that's in jest. In I, I'm I'm jesting. Holy shit! I've been doing this for four hours. I, time time flies when you're talking about things that you like to talk about, um, which is that Hitler was the good guy. So all right, I can't do this every day. <laughs> <laughs> like I like, or I can't do this three times a week because this was like research for for time. So like streams cannot be this this heavy. And I need and, and I need to organize. I actually kind of this was kind of slap. I kind of I think I did this too early. I was I was thinking about waiting a few days, but I'm just but but like no, I'll do it a little bit better and it'll, and I'll have more of my ducks in a row. But the thing is, like, at some point you have to do you have to do it. At some point you just have to do it, right? And I was thinking, oh, I, you know, I could wait a little longer, get these things sorted out, and you know, maybe look a little bit more into the German atrocities, maybe find something more solid than Wikipedia, you know. But but eventually, you just have to bite the bullet and 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 produce some content for the people. Otherwise, the people are going to stop supporting you. So, uh, all right. So that's um, that was this thing. This was a, this was an amazing journey for me. This this was uh, kind of I never I never thought I never thought uh, we'll, we'll try once a week. look eventually I want to get back to three times a week but but in order to get back to three times a week the the thing the 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 stream is gonna have to, to I'm gonna have to figure something out because I can't do this I can't do this three times a week when I first started streaming on here I was able to do this three times a week because I had a big reservoir of things researched. But I can't, and I, I can make a splash screen. I can make a splash screen like this, like every day. I mean, this is this is not very difficult. But um, 
but in terms of the research into things, I can't do that every day. I can't do I can't, or, or three times three times um, a week. I may be able to do something like this once a week, and the other two would have to be like, I don't know, have a guy on and talk about things, and then like maybe one day would be I don't know, maybe we we would have big research Monday, and then talk about Wednesday, and then gaming Friday. You know that maybe that could be the thing. How about? Um, you know, I can do, it won't be like this. So, I mean, it, like, like if I, if I do like, like on a weekly basis, like a research thing, I don't think I could do something like this where it's like four hours. Now, obviously I'm jabbering at the end. So I'm, I'm padding the length. You need to debate. It's. <laughs> I mean, debate who? I mean. Well, I could talk about it. this is why why live debates are hazardous and not necessarily beneficial to those who have a whole lot of unshared assumptions with the audience. Um, yeah, well, I don't. Well, well, gaming gaming streams are free. Gaming streams are just literally pull up the thing and, and play game. I mean, I could do that five days a week if I if you guys would. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to. I don't know if I'd want to play that many that many vidya. But um Sam Hyde is senile, is he? Huh. Has he been taking I don't think he's old enough to be senile. Isn't he like in his mid forties? That's a little that's a little young to be to be senile. But, um, okay. I think I'll I think I'll end the stream. Maybe you know I have the, the opening content. The the ending content doesn't matter because by the time I get to the end. You guys have already watched this. It's the same philosophy with my videos. Like I have all the nice editing at the beginning and stuff. And then as you get into the video, I edit less and less and less because by the time, by a certain point, you're basically committed to watching the video. So I don't have to edit as much. It doesn't have to be as nice. So same with these streams. I start off with like, with like the most well-prepared stuff. And then I drift off into Babel because you're already here. You already paid your money. You don't have to, <laughs> you, I don't need to give you shit at this point. <laughs> Is he's only 37, huh? Wow. Well, I thought he was older. Based on well, never mind. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll I'll end the stream before um before I, I, I talk extemporaneously too much. So goodbye everybody. Goodbye, my my little my little black angels. That's what you are, you my little black.